2020 Board of Commissioners meeting. This is our 530 special meeting. It is being uh, live streamed and we'll be using the Zoom platform uh, tonight. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce my fellow uh, elected officials, Commissioner Dave Bland, Commissioner John Urban, Commissioner Ken McCool, Mayor Pro Tem Garner, Commissioner Jeff Miller, and Commissioner Larry Whitley. We also have Town Manager Hazen Blodgett and Assistant Town Manager Becky Hawk. And tonight we also have a rising freshman from Butler that's observing our meetings. Lucia Paulson is also uh, going to be or observing our meeting tonight. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, Chief Pennington, who is going to talk about uh, some the eight can't wait protocols and some other things about our police policy in Matthews. Chief. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Board of Commissioners. I appreciate you guys making time for me tonight. Uh, I am going to just go through a, a pretty lengthy presentation because there is a lot of topics uh, that I know you guys were interested in hearing from the police department. So I'm going to do my best to, to answer some of those questions you might have and hopefully clarify some of our processes that we've uh, undertaken over the last few years and kind of where we are now. Um, but before I do that, I do want to first off say that I'm going to do this as a screen share. So I won't be able to see all of you. If uh, during the presentation you do have a question, uh, I, I will not be offended if you speak up and say, hold on a second, let me ask a question here. Um, there are about 40 slides that I want to try to get through. Um, it is pretty dense information, so I do want to make sure I cover it adequately. But if you have questions during the, the presentation, please let me know. Um, so with that, I will attempt this screen share and see how we do this. All right, can you all see my presentation starting with Matthews Police Department? Yes. yes. All right. So some of the topics I wanna to talk about tonight um, is gonna be the evolution of our internal affairs and discipline process with the Matthews Police Department from um, prior to me to where we sit now today. I also wanna talk about our Office of Professional Standards and our internal affairs process and our internal affairs unit, if you will. Uh, an early intervention activation system, some of these terms might be new to you, um, which Again, I'm going to do my best to try to explain kind of where we are and the processes that brought us to, to this point. Uh, I also want to talk about our complaint process. These are some of the items that a lot of the commissioners had sent questions to me and we had had lengthy conversations, but to make sure everybody has the same information, we wanted to cover our complaint process from reception to review. How does that work? What does it look like? Uh, what are the checks and balances that we have in place? For that entire process. We're also going to talk about our hiring practices, our current demographics of the agency as it compares to the town of Matthews. Uh, and we also want to cover the eight can't wait. I know I put a um, document out about this about, I guess, maybe a week ago, week and a half ago, but I do want to kind of cover some of the items that were in the eight can't wait for the public and for some of the commissioners if you had questions about them. We're then going to cover de-escalation, our CIT response model, talk about some implicit bias training um, or unconscious bias training, Multiple hats that we wear as law enforcement, which uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, we do wear multiple hats and two of those are social work and enforcement. And how do they, how do they coincide and how do they conflict? And then I also wanna talk about our chief's forum, a citizen advisory committee um, that uh, we've been talking about for a while that you know, we, we would like to see kind of progress forward and then ultimately leave it up to what's next. Where are we gonna go and what are we gonna do? So with that, let me try to pull some of this up because I can't see my entire screen. All right. So historically, the way that our complaint process worked um, was that the chief of police maintained all records and all responsibility for investigating and handling those uh, complaints from its inception through the discipline process. Uh, he handled most of everything that came through. And again, in a smaller organization, um, it, it's it's still problematic, but it's, it's not as hard to manage, but that was the, the system that was in place prior to. The chief also carried the sole responsibility for updating our general orders and our directives as an organization. We'll talk about some of the things that have changed for that, but um, just to briefly touch on it, we have divided up our general orders now amongst all of our commanders. So we're, we're, I'm not the sole responsibility or the sole person that must review, come up with changes, 
uh, and, and implement them. I am the final authority before a, uh, a general order gets distributed to the, to the organization, but it's no longer a sole responsibility. We do parse out parts of our general orders to those commanders and supervisors that have basically SME or the subject matter expert, and they're tasked with doing the research to make sure that we are staying abreast of best practices. Um, and discipline was imposed uh, at the discretion of the chief of police under the old process. Remember, we're talking about history here. Um, so some of those things have changed. And first off, I'll, I'll apologize for this slide. I know it's a little small in size, but there was quite a bit of information I wanted to get out. Um, I will tell you that when I was appointed in January, actually it was January 2nd of 2018, the first order that I did when I came in here, now there were many things I was doing at the same time, but the first general order of policy that I wanted to look at was our internal investigation policy. I wanted to get a better understanding of how the organization operated, where the responsibility lied, or where they laid in those uh, aspects of who did the investigation, who was the review authority, uh, under what um, investigative process did we have, have running. And I will tell you that within a month and two weeks, we had a full revision of our general order uh, and it was revised and put out to the troops on February 15th of 2018. At that time, uh, I really moved toward a internal affairs unit. Uh, I believe that it's important for us to have a professionalized and a trained group of individuals that would look at formal complaints to ensure that we were providing um, one, the most professional investigation. We were in compliance with state and uh, federal law. We were making sure that our employees were afforded the, the due rights, but we were also making sure that the complainant, when they came forward, that they were provided with the most thorough investigation and that we would build trust and legitimacy with our, our citizenry by providing them a very in-depth and thorough investigation. Uh, that was very early on, as I told you, we developed this internal affairs unit. We had initially assigned the administrative captain and the training sergeant at that time, which was an admin position, uh, and again, separated from the majority of the, uh, the, the officers and the employees in the organization, which was the best way to do it at that time. Both of those individuals attended at least a 40 hour block of, invest, of training on internal affairs investigations, uh, and they have since uh, attended much more. Some of the changes that we've also made in our internal affairs or our complaint process, some of the things that, that we really wanted to look at was, I believe it's important, and most of you that, that have listened to me speak and have been around for the last couple of years know that I'm, I'm really data driven. I really want to know what changes do I make and then how does that impact the overall um, you know, information brought into the organization? What's changed based on that change? And one of it was we began tracking all complaints and those complaints that were documented and they were all tracked annually, which we do put out every year. Uh, if you are familiar with our website, uh, we do put this out under uh, one of our pages on the website. You can see the number of use of forces, the number of internal investigations, number sustained, number exonerated and those type of things. Again, it, it's falling in line with that 21st century policing responsibility of being transparent and responsive to our citizens. We also clarified the duties and responsibilities of our organization, at least of um, the internal investigation process, who held, who held the responsibility of conducting the investigation and under which, which process did it go to come to the chief of police and then formalize that process all the way up to town hall where the HR director and ultimately uh, the town manager uh, had input and they were overseeing and basically reviewing the investigation as it was completed. We also developed a standard investigative form. Uh, we, we prior to this operated as, you know, type it up, send it to me and we'll kind of go forward from there. We formalized this investigative process with an overview, an investigative process, individuals that are interviewed, what they said, and then a conclusion block, uh, ultimately then determining if there were any sustained, which uh, means that it, it occurred or that the employee was is held accountable for it, what those sustained violations were. In these changes, uh, it was an inclusion, an inclusion, if you will, of HR review and sign-off. Now, HR is, is a critical part of any professional organization, as most of you know, uh, operating in the business world, they are our subject matter expert when it comes to human resource law, when it comes to what is, uh, what should and what can and can't be asked, what can and can't be included, what can and can't be um, processed through of that information to come to either 
a sustained violation or a not sustained or a non-sustained um, violation. So that process was formalized where we did include HR as a sign off. We also included our use of force uh, in our policy under internal investigation. Any use of force that results in death or serious bodily injury is covered in our use in our uh, internal investigation policy. And there must be, it's an automatic trigger of an internal review of what happened. How did it occur? Why did it occur? What was the outcome? Um, so that we know that we're doing a 100% proactive review before it becomes a complaint. We want to know, because it's such a serious issue, did our employee follow every single process as necessary to that point? Excuse me, Chief. Uh, yes, Mayor Higdon, I got a question, either for you or perhaps for Hazen. Um, when will when will complaints be reviewed with elected officials? Are we going to see it annually? Like uh, I think you're, I think you're paused, Hazen. If you're, I'm sorry, you're muted. I'm still muted. No, Hazen was. Yeah, sorry. That's right. Um, so we do have uh, the annual report that the chief uh, puts out. Um, I think the, in my mind, the question is what's what's protected personnel information and what's not. Now, I don't, Chief, you're not. We're not going to talk about that. To you, you're not going to go into that kind of depth in your presentation. I don't think. I don't remember seeing anything. I'm not. That's that's a pretty extensive law review class that would probably be for a HR professional uh, or attorney who specializes in HR law to clarify. So, Mayor, do you have an ask? To, do you have an ask in there? Yes, I think that having the elected body only made aware of complaints annually once per year is insufficient. I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in, but I, I would like to, doesn't it would not have to be necessarily, you know, names of officers or whatever, but we, I think, would like to be made aware of, of, of complaints more or less when they happen monthly or, or quarterly or something, not, not once a year. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment, Commissioner Bland. I, I, I think that's something that we really need to do, to do that we need, again, maybe not the names of any of the people involved, but what happened, uh, what's being done to look to address it and bring us up to speed so that we don't get blindsided and hit in the face with it, number one, and number two, so that if we think that additional corrective action or additional you know, eyes need to get on it, that we can take those measures and see to it that it gets done because I mean, I think it'll uh, prevent from happening as opposed to creating problems. I, I concur. And also, I, I, what if an officer get in a shooting? Certainly, we ought to know that. Ella ser seriously injured somebody. And I know at this time, and then I, I know I, the mayor and I was talking, uh, I, how often can we know that if an officer has more than uh, one complaint or harassing or something that a citizen's complaint on? I think that's what the mayor is talking about. I know I I don't want to I don't want to be a commissioner and somebody something happened. And I don't know nothing about it or just roughly don't know any details. Not going into the whole thing. I think that's what John is at. and keeping your privacy of what what we can and what we can know. Well, if you don't, I'm sorry, go ahead, Aizen. I saw you about to say well, something. Well, I guess I was going to say, I think I understand the issue. I think what we got to do is come back with y'all with a process that's legal, both legal and transparent. Okay. And, and all I would say, and, and I, I completely appreciate where you're coming from, I just want to remind that, you know, there must be a separation of uh, political processes and political influence on promotions, discipline, and hiring practices because, you know, we, if anything, we learn from history that we've got to keep those two things separate. I, I am doing my best to get emails out to you guys when, when major events happen within the town. We have a homicide. Um, I know we had one the other day with it. I sent an email out to you guys immediately just to let you guys know what was happening. That is absolutely my goal and, and what we will do in the midst of an officer-involved shooting because absolutely, I want you guys to be aware of what's transpiring in the town so that when you start getting calls, um, you hopefully have developed a level of confidence in, in my abilities and that you'll also have a level of confidence then that you can pass on to the citizens. Okay, thank you. I, I can't see if anybody else wants to make a comment, just jump in. Otherwise, uh, go ahead and proceed, Chief. 
Okay, and uh, some of the other changes that we've looked at, just so that everybody is, is aware, if you haven't seen them, we have streamlined our ability of individuals to submit compliments or complaints. You know, we, we do want to we do want to hear when our officers do a good job. And I'll be honest with you, they do a good job or uh, let me rephrase that. They do a great job every single day um, to serve the citizens of Matthews. Uh, and, and we want to, to listen to that feedback because we're going to grow as an organization hearing from our citizenry or hearing from our customers, basically, to tell us what we're doing right and what they'd like to see us change. So we have we have expanded our ability to to receive these complaints and to receive these compliments in multiple different ways. And now we've always taken them by phone. We've always taken them by somebody walking into the police headquarters and providing a complaint, saying they had a complaint and speaking with the supervisor. We have streamlined that and we've codified it into our, um, our processes that requires documentation. No longer just verbally does somebody say they were dissatisfied with the performance of an officer and we just take that and see what we can do with it. We document every single complaint that comes in. External complaints are very important to us. We wanna know what the citizenry thinks so that is part of the change in the process. We've also provided a pamphlet. Um, I did send that. I, I'm sorry, Lori, I don't know if you emailed it to them or if it's up on the website. Please take a look at it. We developed a pamphlet, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago um, that is kept at headquarters. It's also online. Uh, they can go online and file a complaint or compliment. And they can also use uh, something that started in 2018, very shortly after I was here, we entered into a phone app where you can provide feedback to the organization and that feedback goes directly to our Office of Professional Standards or the Internal Affairs Unit to kind of process through. We've, we've added these particular issues as in, in a compliance with the 21st century policing where we want to be as transparent as possible and we want to solicit that feedback from our, our citizens. I want to chime in please. Um, I, I would like to echo what Dave, uh, Larry and John have said. Uh, I don't think that, first of all, we all have utmost confidence in you, Chief, and no question in your ability to lead this department. Uh, but, or I should say, and as elected officials, none of us want to be involved in your hiring and firing practices. However, uh, it would be nice to know and especially in light of the George um, Floyd murder, that officer had 18 complaints against him. Uh, when there are multiple complaints, we could be blindsided by something and it would be nice to have some preventative measure in place to say, this person is already under scrutiny by the department, not under scrutiny by the elected officials. Um, and how can we make that happen? So, I, you know, I listened in on a call and I don't know if it was the Metro Mayor's conference, uh, conference call or who it was and citizen review boards, you know, um, they don't have much authority, but I, I think it sounds like the legislature is working on giving them subpoena authority so that they could even subpoena officers. I don't think we're going into that depth of wanting to know the details, but um, it, it would be nice to know if there are any sort of harassment or complaint, complaints against officers, and not just officers, but anybody on town staff. And, and I can appreciate that, and, and I hope I'm going to address some of that with our early intervention activation system, something we put in place about a year ago, um, you know, foreshadowing some of these conversations, because it, it's about transparency. So my job is to keep the town manager and the board apprised of things that, that definitely they need to know, and uh, we will do that to our best of ability. So if it, I'm sorry, any other questions before I continue on? All right, just an example of a complaint reception process. We do have what you're looking at now is a screenshot of the our app that is downloadable on any, uh, whether it be iTunes or any other platform that you use. This is the app that's downloadable. If you look down in the lower right-hand corner, I'm sorry, the lo lower left-hand corner of your screen, I've highlighted it in a red circle. There is an opportunity for a citizen to provide feedback. Uh, now, one change I do want to change is if you look up top, that is after you hit feedback, that's the next screen you're going to see. It's a complaint. We are going to change it to complimenting complaint because I think it's important, again, as I said, to make sure we're bringing in all of the positives as well as some of the suggestive changes. 
Um, so they can file this directly on our app. And again, I told you, just like our online version, which I'm gonna cover here in a second, this goes directly to internal affairs. This does not come to the supervisor where it might be lost. This goes directly to our internal affairs where it's logged, tracked, and briefed directly to me. Next one is, this is a screenshot of our webpage. So if you notice on the top side of the webpage, there is a compliment complaint procedure. Uh, I did not take any additional screenshots, but if you wanna go on there and look, there's an opportunity to provide uh, information, name, date of birth, or I'm sorry, name, uh, location, incident, uh, and contact information so we can get back to the individual and conduct the investigation. So those are on both of our, our platforms on, on an app and on our website. This is an example. This is the front page of our uh, pamphlet that I discussed earlier. I know it's probably you can't see all of it, but I think I sent one to Lori, so you will have a copy of it. Um, just kind of outlines exactly what is a complaint? What is a compliment? How is it handled? Uh, what can you expect from the police department? Um, and where are we going to go from there? So I think it's very important to educate an individual of what's going to happen to make sure we're having a clear expectation of what they can expect from us. This is the backside of that pamphlet that's uh, a trifold, if you will. You can see the compliment or complaint form that is identical to what you will see online. So the online version was built from this version, but it gives you a little bit more information and education on what an internal complaint is, what a compliment will do, uh, how do we process it as an organization. So let me move the screen a little bit so I can get to it, but Next, I wanna talk about the Office of Professional Standards. We've talked about internal affairs and I don't wanna confuse the two because Office of Professional Standards, if you will, is kind of the umbrella unit or the umbrella, um, yeah, it's a Lieutenant now in charge of it, but it's the umbrella unit that allows us to oversee multiple different things. And I'm gonna talk about that, uh, what the Office of Professional Standards is, but it was, it's basically maintained, or it was established to maintain some ethical accountability of the culture of our organization. You know. We expect certain things from our officers and our employees and to expect those and to trust that they're all going to do exactly what we want, um, as you guys have said, you know, is, is kind of not productive. So what we do is we put this Office of Professional Standards in place to kind of check those processes, make sure our employees are doing what they're supposed to be doing. We're checking email or um, text messages back and forth on our on our computer uh, MDTs, mobile data terminals. We're going to make sure that communication is is within policy. We're going to make sure that uh, nobody's checking uh, tags or anything outside of, of legal parameters. So that's what the Office of Professional Standards does. It's also, again, kind of a subset to that is our internal affairs. It's its key function, right? He he reports directly to the chief of police in these matters. When we're talking internal affairs, it's not uncommon for me to meet directly with the internal affairs investigator or the officer professional standards lieutenant and have a conversation about the internal processes that are happening so that I'm made directly aware because we don't want it to get lost in communication through some chain of command. I want it coming directly to me. I will thank the board that in FY20, we codified this position. Uh, it was kind of operating as a sergeant under a captain. It really didn't work. Um, we did a study from CPSM. Uh, it was an organization we contracted with to look at our entire organization. And this is one key area that they recommended immediate change in the organization is to have this position be a lieutenant and have that lieutenant with command authority report directly to the chief as it comes to internal affairs matters. So we made that change and I thank the board for that. That position was also agreed to be a CALEA position. And we're gonna talk about CALEA here in a minute, but CALEA is the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. It's a professional organization. It's a very prestigious um, designation, if you will. And we're gonna talk about that, like I said, in a minute, but his responsibility also covers that CALEA coordination, making sure that we will meet those standards to become accredited nationally and also uh, on a state level. With that, he's also our early intervention system monitor. He, he covers, he, he tracks, he makes sure that when we get a flag under our early intervention system, which we're gonna talk about again in a minute, um, kind of as we go through this Office of Professional Standards, um, he makes sure that it's communicated through the chain of command down to the employee supervisor, review is done, um, possible conflicts or issues are, are made aware to all the way up the chain of command, and then a system can be put in place to hopefully work with that employee to, to get them any assistance or uh, take disciplinary action as necessary. 
So Kalia, real quick, and, and I don't want to, and it's a lot of words on this. I'm not going to go every, over every single one of them, um, but the Commission for Accreditation for Law Enforcement, Kalia, is a very prestigious organization. It is a highly sought after uh, accreditation process. That This accreditation is one that is weighed against a series of uh, anywhere from 189 to 400 and 27 standards, depending on what size organization and what you offer. Um, but this accreditation is all best practices. For an agency to meet a CALEA accreditation, this, this, this you know, recognition nationwide, they must meet all of the standards and be able to prove that they're, that they're following or doing what they say they're doing. So that we have to do what's called standards. We required to provide a standard for each one of these, um, these, these accreditation numbers every year for three years, and then it's reviewed by a board. So um, it is accepted by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. It is recognized by National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. It's recognized by Police Executive Research Forum, among many, many others, as the most prestigious. And those organizations that can meet these, these criteria uh, are within best practices. Chief, Khalid, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy for you to do that. That's a it is what you just said, a most prestigious, and a lot of people can't obtain that, but I commend you for heading us that way. Well, I, I do want to tell you, and, and we have started this process about two years ago. So immediately uh, when I walked in, I know Hazen and I had many conversations about Kalia. He has been supportive of us seeking this, this prestigious, um, you know, I guess, recognition. We have been updating our general orders along the standards of Kalia. Every time we do a general order, we're trying to put within our general order what CALEA standard that order covers. And if that, if that order does not cover all the standards it needs to, that's when we're updating. We're kind of ahead, ahead of the curve here. So as we start that's moving good. forward with this process, I know we're going to be so much better off. It takes three years from the time you apply to be a CALEA accredited. Um, they give you three years to meet all the standards. I don't think it's going to take us nearly three years once we apply. I'm hoping we're going to be anywhere from 12 to 18 months before we have assessors on site looking at us, speaking to the community. And again, the other part of this is the community gives feedback on the organization, on the positives, on the negatives, on maybe some of the things they'd like to see change. And I wouldn't even call them negative, some of the challenges. Um, so I'm really excited about us. And we started this thing about two years ago. That's a good job. Good job. Some of the benefits of us going, uh, getting CALEA accredited will be, um, it will help us limit liability and risk of exposure because we're going to show um, the courts that we are within best practices of professional organizations from around the world. Again, these are outside assessors. It's not us saying we're doing it. They're going to bring in, CALEA brings in multiple assessors to look at our, our process, look at our uh, building, look at how we do, do business, um, and look at all of our standards and proofs of those standards. Again, I kind of jumped ahead here, but we began preparing in about January of 2018. Our orders are, and they are being updated, or they were, and they are being updated to CALEA standards. Um, we have done the preliminary crucial work. I think, I think we're ahead of the game on this. I, we're almost ready to put in our application to hopefully bring some people um, around to take a look at what we do. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to tout the organization too much, but I'll tell you that, that this, this police department of Matthews is well ahead of, of most organizations in this area um, with the CALEA and the way that we're operating. So we did, we did receive approval from the town manager to move forward on this. So we will, um, initial payments for this will come out of a, our current budgeted funds, um, but subsequent any additional costs, we will be requesting future uh, budgeted cons budget consideration for uh, moving forward and keeping this thing in line. Again, there's a three-year timeline for accreditation. I don't think it's gonna take us nearly three years to get uh, fully accredited. So next, I'll talk about the early intervention system. Uh, early intervention is a program that we went out and um, it was one of the, the programs I wanted to see the organization adopt about a year and a half ago. Last year's budget, we did go into the IA Pro, which is, an, excuse me, it's an internal affairs pro. Um, it's just a program that helps us track all internal investigations, track the outcomes, tra track the officers, and then it flags any considerable uh, problems, if you will, or possible problems to ensure that the supervision and the command staff is made aware and we can step in where necessary. And, and let me just give you a quick example of something like this might be if you, you have an officer who may be going through a divorce, um, that is a very stressful situation, a very 
um, you know, common situation around America. But what is uncommon is the officer is now in a position where he must go out on the street, put his personal stressors aside and react to what is in front of him rather than being maybe short tempered. So the IA system will help us identify, should we start getting civility complaints on an officer? If we get two civility complaints, it flags the early intervention activation system for us to now sit down with the officer and have a conversation. What's going on, you know, with HR, obviously we're gonna, we include them in this, but what's going on in your personal life? What's going on in your professional life? Why are we starting to see this increase and in maybe, you know, quick to judgment or, 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 you know, maybe quick to anger. So this early intervention activation system was a huge improvement in the way that we monitor our employees to make sure that we are not allowing them to continue down a path where they may be stressed out at home or stressed out at work. Maybe we start to see an officer who works a high crime area and starts to see a couple of use of forces. Well, that's going to flag. We need to say, okay, back up. We need to probably move him out of that position or reevaluate whether or not he's in the right position. So this early intervention activation system is huge for us. There are two different ways that we deal with this. So supervisors are always tasked with the responsibility of constantly monitoring the conduct, right? We always want our supervisors to be involved. That's why this corporal sergeant process um, that we, we end up running, it's so crucial to make sure that the right individuals are overseeing uh, the mass of our organization because we want them to be involved and we need them to, to take this responsibility very seriously. So there's two levels. The first level involves the employee's immediate supervisor. It allows them to address problems or deficiency as early as possible. So we want, the, the, we want to change that unwanted behavior. We want to identify an individual who might be going through some, something personally or professionally, and we want to change any unwanted behavior. So any patterns that the first line supervisor starts to observe, for example, tardiness. If we start to see an employee who's showing up late for work a couple of days in a month, or maybe it's been three months and they've been late two or three times, we want to figure out what's going on. It flags that because the supervisor is required to track that in blue team or under the IA pro. The second way to do this, or the second level, if you will, is an administrative tracking incident. So this is a 12 month period and it's a rolling 12 months. It's not just a calendar 12 month. What I mean by that is in March, if you get you know, a civility complaint and then in you know, February of the following year, you get a civility complaint, that's within 12 months. So we would obviously flag this early intervention activation system. The way that we operate is if you get two or more internal disciplinary complaints um, under our internal investigation process, regardless of final closure. So when I say final closure, um, and, and I may be going quick on this and I apologize, I, I take for granted sometimes that I'm speaking the same language as you guys, but you know, a non-sustained complaint basically says that the, you know, the, the employee did not commit the violation as stated. Maybe it was, it happened, but it's not a violation or um, an exonerated complaint. Somebody said an officer did something that's absolutely a violation of policy, but during the investigation, we determined that maybe it was a false complaint Maybe it didn't happen that way. We have body camera that proves it otherwise. That would be an exonerated. But it doesn't matter if it's a sustain, which means the employee did something inappropriate or, or uh, outside of policy. Doesn't matter. We get two complaints within 12 months. It flags early intervention activation system, which then requires the supervisor and the commander to meet, meet with the employee and determine whether or not there might be some underlying issue. Three or more external complaints of the same nature, disciplinary performance, regardless of the final closure. So two or more internal complaints, three or more external complaints of the same nature, discipline or not, we're going to flag automatically. And any use of force, um, level four would be something like guiding and directing an individual into handcuffs. Uh, another level one would be something like presenting his firearm, right? So the higher the level, the less time it takes. If we get a, all level one use of forces are investigated, um, two at fault crashes, we will automatically activate this. There's a whole parameter and that's set up by the system. We can change it as necessary and we're open for conversation on that. Two or more supervisory notes, regardless of outcome. And I'm talking about negative supervisory notes like uh, individual had a negative attitude in roll call. You know, individual is, uh, you know, pulled back from the department or from our squad, not interacting during uh, department meetings, those type of things. Those are negative or or concerning notes, we're gonna sit down, it's gonna flag our early intervention activation system or any combination of the above. So what do we do when we get them? So 
the resolution of any early activation system or intervention system may be formal or informal. Uh, again, we do require documentation on every one of these activations. So there could be no additional action. It could just be the supervisor must sit down with the commander, uh, talk to the employee, realize that there's nothing there. The two and maybe the two external complaints were exonerated or not sustained. But we still want to have that conversation with the employee. How does it impact you? How do you feel about it? You know, how can we help you? You know, avoid these type of situations in the future. We could have informal counseling or informal monitoring by the supervisor, meaning we're going to have them required to sit down every 30 days or require them to sit down every quarter to kind of talk about what has been going on. Uh, inform, I'm sorry, formal monitoring. Uh, this would be done under the Internal Affairs Unit for a minimum of 12 weeks. Well, we might do a monthly formal review. And when I mean formal review, sit down formal review of their performance up to that point, and it's documented. Or we could do mandatory remedial, meaning we could have additional training for the officer. We could require that training on top of their already mandated extensive amount of training we do every single year. There's also a way that if an employee during that interview uh, indicates that he is struggling, that early uh, the employee assistance program might help, um, we automatically and we require the supervisor to forward that up the chain of command to the HR uh, director so that they can be involved with the uh, employee assistance program. Employee assistance program is a key part of this early intervention activation system. It's a key part to making sure our employees are healthy, um, both mentally and physically. So we, we use that extensively. Hey, Carl, if, sure. one of your, if one of your employees uh, uh, say involved and in maybe go investigate an accident where maybe some kids uh, die in that presence and there, and your, your officer maybe want to talk to somebody, is this part of that where it comes there where it maybe needs some time off just to have some counsel to help them to get over that? It, it might be, but that, that's kind of a, a whole different process for us. That's a critical incident response or a critical incident uh, peer review, if you will. So what we do, and, and let me give you, first, let me back up for the early intervention. Let me give you a, an, a better example of what the early intervention activation system might be. Um, if we have an employee who receives a couple of um, civility complaints, meaning he was rude, the complaint is, you know, your officer was just rude to me. He didn't listen to me. Um, we will follow up and we'll look into that. Um, we, we had one of these in the, in the near past. Uh, after we sat down with the employee, he was or she was very uh, forthcoming with information and said, look, I'm under a lot of stress with this COVID. You know, every call I go on could be one I got to separate from my family for two weeks. I'm under a lot of stress with these riots and the community and, and um, you know, the town or the elected officials may not be on my side and it becomes a stressful issue. Then we're able to say, perfect, we, we identified an employee who got flagged, if you will, and we've gotten that employee or we got that employee into our, uh, employee assistance program. And, and it's a success story. Really, that's what we want to see, right? We want to be proactive yeah. with identifying whether or not something's coming up. So that's, that's one success story. And I'm, I can't go too deep into that. And I hope I didn't go too deep as it was. But I think it's, it's important to know that, that we're doing this on a continuous basis. Um, Another issue, what you just asked about, uh, Reverend Whitley, was a critical incident. So I will use the example of the, the young child that was killed by his mother uh, and found in a cemetery several months ago. Uh, I, was, I got the call early in the morning that we had this missing child, or actually it was at night, but early in the morning that this missing child was then found, um, found dead in the cemetery. And it was found by a couple of our police officers. And that investigation really was run uh, by the Matthews Police Department with the assistance of Charlotte. Those officers we knew um, are going to have a tough time, right? We, we know that death, right. especially of a small right. child, is, is something that impacts us. So I spoke immediately with Tanya McGovern, and Tanya was phenomenal at working with us and getting counselors to show up the very next morning. I think the next morning or the next day they worked to just be available. Uh, we had several employees that took those counselors up on that, just wanted to speak yeah. and wanted to talk and and work through the process. But we have both of those that we we really That's good. Uh, try to work as a team with HR on. That's good. I was on the critical team when I was on the highway patrol and I knew how important that was. And uh, that's good, Clark, I appreciate it. Thank you. So our complaints process uh, from reception to completion, all improper or all complaints of improper unsatisfactory performance are documented by our supervisors. Remember, that's one of the changes that we talked about. Anytime we get a complaint, 
The supervisors are required to, to document those. Now that is a change. So what I will tell you is, is, you know, when you make a change like this, that you are now requiring documentation and it's something that we're tracking every single year, you may see an uptick, right? It doesn't, it, it's not a flag for the board. And I, I hope you guys uh, are listening to this part of it, that just because you see an uptick in complaints doesn't necessarily mean there's an issue. What it means, and hopefully what it's saying to you, is your police department is tracking those, we are taking them seriously, and we are documenting them now more than ever to make sure that we are following a process to make sure our citizens or our customers are serviced and they are getting um, at least the response they deserve when they take the time to lodge a complaint. So anonymous complaints are investigated. Um, we will take an anonymous complaint. As long as they provide us with enough information that we can collaborate or corroborate that the offense possibly took place, you give us a date, time, and an officer name, okay, now I'm going to look into it. If you tell me one of your officers is, is on the take, well, that's not giving me a whole lot of information, right? So we do need a little bit more than just, hey, one of your officers is on the take, or one of your officers is corrupt. You know, that's not enough. But you give me something, we will take an anonymous complaint. Again, a change. So we have our types of complaints. We have performance complaints, right? These are typically internal complaints that happen from a supervisor or from another employee that might say something to the effect of, hey, this officer is always out of his beat. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. You know, supervisor, you need to track this or you need to watch it. Or it might be something to the effect of a supervisor uh, observes uh, insubordination from, a, from, a, from an officer or subordinate. If that happens, that's a performance complaint. And that's going to be what we call an internal or um, type performance, that, something that he's not doing that he should be doing. External complaints, anything that comes in from outside. Again, 100% tracking of external complaints. If somebody calls us and wants to lodge a complaint, we will track it, we will investigate it, and we will report on it. Internally generated might be something to the effect of maybe the performance complaint is now turned into a disciplinary issue, like performance complaints. Somebody showed up late for work once or twice. Now he showed up late for work multiple times within, you know, 60 days. We got a real problem here. Maybe we've taken corrective action under performance where we did documented counseling. We did early intervention. It's not working. The employee still doesn't show up. Now we're going to generate a more formal IA complaint and we're going to take possibly disciplinary action. And then our professional standards complaint. This is what happened or this category, I should say, is what was developed. Um, as a result of our Office of Professional Standards, something that we pushed, I know, back in, what was it, 1920 in that budget. Any serious violation of Department General Orders, that is investigated by our Internal Affairs Unit. Um, allegations of a criminal violation. Now, these are a little different than just violations of policy, right? We're going to run what's called a dual track. We're going to run a simultaneous criminal investigation with an internal investigation because if there is a criminal issue, there's some, some Garrity rules, there's some, some um, Brady rules, there's, some, there's all kinds of things we've got to kind of keep track of to make sure that we're not violating the Fourth Amendment, right, illegal search and seizure, with the requirement of forcing them to answer questions to their employee. I can't force an employee to answer a question that might be criminal in nature because I can't use that answer against him in trial. So we've got to do a dual track, if you will, uh, on these. And that's all done by professional standards. That's all done by our internal affairs, uh, typically the lieutenant or the captain over those that area. And any complaint or special investigation designated by me or the chief of police. That could be something uh, as serious or as special as hostile work environment. Could be as serious and special as sexual harassment. Um, anything that I determine I want internal affairs to handle because it's such a critical nature and I want it to be you know, tracked and, and, and managed from that perspective, I can do that. Talked about these a little bit, but here's some of the definitions. I'm not going to hit each one of them because I did, but the completed investigations will be classified as one of these. Uh, there is one additional and we just call it uh, administrative closure. And we can talk about that in a second, but exonerated means the allegation occurred, but was legal, proper, and necessary. Not sustained or non-sustained, the allegation did occur, but facts were insufficient to demonstrate a violation. So sustained, though, on the other hand, is, is basically that it occurred and there's enough evidence to sustain a, um, a disciplinary action on that issue. Unfounded, it's false, or the investigation provided no facts to substantiate the allegation. Like, you tell me I've got a, an officer on the take, 
you know, are you telling me, you know, Chief Pennington's on the take, but there's nothing to substantiate. Well, it's an unfounded because you can't even get to a, a, uh, a violation there. Once it's completed, the investigating, um, the investigating officer, I'm sorry, the officer supervisor prepares a, recommend, a written disciplinary recommendation uh, after to come forward. What that does is, you know, we're including the supervisor in that process. That supervisor knows his performance, um, does review the case, provides a written recommendation for discipline. That isn't the only step, right? That next step happens, then it goes up to the commander. And once the lieutenants are in place, it would go to the, the commander, let's say, of the patrol division. The lieutenant of the patrol division would review the facts, review the situation, review the recommendation by the, the uh, supervisor, concur or non-concur. If they non-concur with the recommendation, they will provide written documentation of what they expect uh, discipline to be. And it kind of comes up the, through the chain of command all the way to me. Every level um, of every investigation comes to me. At that point, I would review it, weigh the recommendation uh, against what hopefully the supervisor completed, which is called the Douglas factors. Um, I don't want to go too deep into this, but the Douglas factors is a U.S. Supreme Court case of Douglas v. the uh, United States um, Veterans Affairs on disciplining a employee. There are 12 factors that must be considered to ensure that, that we are putting or we are disciplining or delving out the appropriate discipline to an employee based on weighted factors. Those factors, and, and I can send them to you if you'd like, but there's 12 of them. Has this ever occurred before? What is the past discipline of an employee who committed a similar violation? What's the performance of this employee for the course of his career? Is this something that is so egregious or well known in the, in the public that it reduces the effectability or the, the legitimacy of the police department. There's multiple factors that, that have to be looked at. Um, but when it comes to me, I look at all of that. Now, all of that goes to HR. Our HR, um, let me just go to this next slide. I apologize. Our HR will review all of this information for legal purposes, make sure that what we did is legal under HR law, that we are taking the appropriate action and if, if HR does not agree with my recommendation or my final recommendation, we have that conversation. Uh, and, and we talk about that. And some of those facts may be weighed against our HR expert. An HR expert um, is somebody that we have uh, contracted through that is extremely knowledgeable about HR law, extremely knowledgeable about what we can and can't do um, for discipline and during the investigative process. So we're, we're very blessed in, in having um, Mac on in that, that position, which I know Tanya will talk about here shortly, but this is kind of how it, it operates. We start from the incident, we conduct, we get the complaint, we do the reception, we figure out how it came in, we investigate it, the officer uh, is, is notified of the complaint, they're interviewed, uh, as well as by that time, all of our complaints have been interviewed, the investigation's completed and it goes up through the chain of command. So there are many different eyes that are on this thing to make sure that we are doing it the way we're supposed to be doing it. Just another flow chart for you to see kind of how it works. And, and unfortunately, this we have not updated this flow chart since we went to the Officer Professional Standards Lieutenant. So where you see Ops Sergeant, that would be on the Ops Lieutenant. Um, but that investigation is the way that it would work. Additional steps. Uh, again, we talked about this. Uh, sustained complaints are forwarded to the HR director where she reviews and comments. Uh, complaints will be reviewed and discussed with the town human resources attorney for legal sufficiency or, or the uh, the expert in HR law. This this expert then separate is separate and it is distinct from the police department. So it allows us to weigh our investigation and our discipline recommendation against uh, legal sufficiency, so that we know that the town is going to get the biggest um, bang for its buck, if you will, the best response as it is for an organization, not just the agency. When I say organization, I'm talking about the town of Matthews. When I talk about agency, I'm talking about us in this particular moment. We wanna make sure that, that a, the HR expert is reviewing what we did, reviewing what we're recommending, sees everything that we need them to see to help us make a, a determination of discipline and then helps us kind of move forward with that. Uh, any discipline resulting in demotion, suspension, or termination will be automatically reviewed by the HR attorney and the HR um, uh, director. Questions about from inception to response on our internal affairs issues. 
Okay. I know it's a lot of information and, and I've had a lot of conversations with most of you, but uh, I'm still open for more if we want to continue that. Uh, well, just, just, I have now the HR attorney, is this Scott McGlatchy? Is that no, who sir. we're talking about? No, sir. All right. So who is the <laughs> HR attorney? So uh, we use uh, Mac McCarley with Parker Poe for the HR and um, he confers with Charlie um, and uh, Mac, Mac advises us on HR matters. And his, his name is Mac who? Mac McCarley. Okay. All right. So we got a, a attorney for the HR and attorney for the police department too. Is that correct? Correct. Now I don't. You know, it's funny. You know, the the uh, uh, police department attorney Clark. The way I would say, well, he advises you guys on what current state of the law, uh, best practices. How would how would you describe what? Uh, I would, first off, I would describe him as absolutely invaluable to me in the way that we operate because he advises me on, for example, today, or, or uh, we may get a asset forfeiture, something that's seized under the, the Drug Enforcement Administration that he needs to advise us, how do we proceed? What's the investigation? Is it something that meets it, it doesn't meet it? So we don't get wrapped up into some legal lawsuit um, in the future. So he advises me on that, he advises me on um, updating case law. He advises me on public information access when it comes to police recordings, when it comes to what we can and can't release. Um, we had a public information access request come in that some of you are quite familiar with um, from a local resident who wanted everything that we could produce that she might have been in, which becomes problematic. And what is it that we can, can produce under the legal side of this? Where do I got to go to get a judge to sign off on? What do I have to do to release some of those documents? What do I have to do to release some of those videos and phone calls? So he, he's invaluable to us. And, and I would argue, and I know my email said this, and I may be jumping ahead a little bit here, Hayes, and if you tell me to be quiet, I will. Um, the, you know, he, he specializes in criminal law to making, to make sure that we are within our jurisdictional boundaries, jurisdictional law. What can we, and can't we do within the jurisdiction of our office? What can and can't we do within the jurisdiction of our, our geographic boundaries? He, he specializes in criminal law. He does not specialize in HR law. Right. Clark, I, listen, I'm 100%. You need it. It's, it's, it's a time we live in that you got to have that so that we can make sure that all that we're doing are, are, are correct so that we don't get sued. And I, I, my, my asking is simply for to be informed. And I, I want to know how many attorneys we got. You know, who, we, who are those attorneys? I think that's something that the council, the mayor, I think we should know who we got. And that's a good thing. It's good thing that people are professional in that. I truly understand that. And my only ask is that's good that we know that. I just want to know who they are and what kind of money we're paying them. If that's coming out of your salary, uh, out of your budget, that's fine. I don't have a problem. Yeah, we, we have had this police attorney since before 2001. And it is uh, it is a line item in our budget for his particular services. Okay. Thank you, Carl. All right, we'll move on hiring practices. Uh, I know some questions came up about how do we hire, you know, um, I spoke about it at the uh, Black Lives Rally matter, or Black Lives Rally um, that we had here in town about our hiring practices and our, our devotion for inclusion and diversity. So uh, our recruiting unit is made up of one individual, just like everywhere else in a small organization, our recruiting officer holds many hats. He's also our background investigator um, that works under our training unit. Um, but, you know, we, we really take pride in making sure that we are out recruiting the highest quality candidates we can find. Uh, and also in that recruitment is making sure we're going to locations that we're going to have the, the most diverse population that might apply to be here in, in Matthews, because we do want to make sure we have a diverse work group. So these are just some of the things in 2019, the applications that we viewed and processed, some of our candidates interviewed, how many uh, conditional offers, offers we provided, and then ultimately how many we hired. Some of our hiring practices, again, our recruiting unit continues to search and expand at these career fairs. Um, you know, the NC4ME, which is Military Career Fair, um, which was a one we added last year at the request and, and um, direction of our HR director and her staff on how we should proceed forward. These are just some of the ones that, that we've been out to. It's a strong focus, continues to be 
at our basic law enforcement training programs. We, we are blessed to have, um, excuse me, two BLET programs right here in our area with uh, Central Piedmont and South Piedmont. Um, I, this last two years, I have gone to every single recruit class and I've spoken about Matthews and where we're going and what we're doing. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, they're, they're extremely impressed of what we're doing over here. They're very, very excited. And, and we might not have any applications come out of that recruiting class until we go in there and speak. And once we speak, we typically get several come out of that class. And we've got some of our, our best candidates come out of that class in the last couple of years. So that is one of our strong focuses. Under 21st century policing, I know many of you have heard me talk about this. This is something that, that's like my Bible, if you will, um, with recommendation and action items. Some of the recommendations coming out of 21st century policing, it mandates and it, well, recommends, but it's really a mandate to organizations to create a workforce that has a broad range of diversity, right? We don't want to just look at race. We also got to look at gender and language and cultural backgrounds, things that are going to impact the way that we want to do business here in Matthews that we're making sure that we are being inclusive. And we'll talk about demographics here in a minute. Um, well, we'll talk about it right now. Uh, demographics. So let's look real quick at the town of Matthews. Town of Matthews is on the left side of your screen. We, in the town of Matthews, according to the census, are about 81% Caucasian or white. Uh, we're about 10% black or African-American, 3% uh, Asian, and about 6% Hispanic or Latino. You look over to the right now, I did not include all all uh, employees of the town of Matt, or I'm sorry, of the Matthews Police Department. I did want to focus on sworn because I think that's where I was getting the majority of the questions um, from the board and from some of our residents is what is our makeup? You know, it's important because we want to represent the community in which we police, right? Everybody wants to know that we are representing who Matthews is in our police department. Well, I'll tell you, we're 79% white or, or, or white or Caucasian, and we're 17% black or African American. 2% Hispanic or Latino and 2% Asian. I'll tell you, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, I still believe that, that we can improve in, in one area that I will tell you that I, I definitely wanna see uh, more inclusion is in our Hispanic and Latino community. You know, we, we have that 2%, um, which really is we just hired a individual who speaks Spanish. We lost one to retirement, but now we only have one. And our focus is to increase this diversity uh, across all lines. So that's, that's where the town of Matthews and the Matthews Police Department lies. Questions on that? All right, hiring since 2018. I know I'm getting close to time, so I'm gonna try to pick this up a little bit, but hiring practices since 2018. Looks like I'm missing a number. Um, for some reason it didn't show up, but I will tell you because I know it by heart, it's 23%. 23% of our hires since, and this is sworn, since 2018 is African-American, 3%. Uh, Asian and Hispanic, and 71% have been white. So um, we are working with Becky, we're working with um, um, Tanya, and we are really looking to be a diverse population within our workforce. So this has been our hiring practices. Again, uh, what's missing there is an African-American, 23% of our hires. All right, Chief, how, Chief how, many, how many sworn officers do you have? Uh, we are currently sitting 63 allotted, 63 here. We have uh, four in background, so what is that? Uh, fifty-nine. Currently hired fifty-nine, but we are we are allotted sixty-three. Real, this is this is going to take me long because I know you all received this, but the eight can't wait. Um, this was a social media movement um, that started in June of twenty twenty. Um, it was uh, put out. Um, I don't remember which group it was—a Black Lives Matter group that put this out, but it was. It was a way for the local governments and police departments to kind of reduce what they claim would be a 72% reduction in police violence. I, I don't know where that number comes from. I haven't seen the data, um, but I will tell you that I put out a six page document on this that really outlined what we do and the majority of them we already do or already did. What I took the opportunity to do is to help clarify some of those to make sure that our public knew that we were listening we were making adaptive changes where necessary, but the majority of these were in place uh, and it did take some clarification. So uh, the ban strangleholds and chokeholds was in there. I did update that um, most recently to include that language. Um, and I also, uh, if you look at required de-escalation, we continue the training on what's called sanctity of life. Um, we always put the human life before property or anything else. So that sanctity of life philosophy is something that we've been pushing. Um, 
So I'm not going to go through each one of these. I did a six page document. I really don't want to kill it. Um, so you guys can kind of, you know, look it over. If you have any questions about that, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Okay. With silence, we'll keep going. I've got a quick question, Chief. Yes, sir. I've been asked numerous times over the last month or so, and, and I have read your document that you produced a couple times, but in, in a nutshell, uh, for the elevator speech for the community, for all the commissioners and myself, are there any areas where you currently don't meet eight can't wait, but plan on making changes so that you do meet it? Um, exhausted intervene. Absolutely not. Could, am I open to, you know, require de-escalation? That terminology, how do you require de-escalation? Um, we do have, um, uh, language in our use of force policy that requires an officer to seek um, a safe location. If they can seek a safe location to, to continue that dialogue, then they don't have to shoot. We're going to do that, which we have seen in the past. Um, our officers, I can give you several examples of use of forces that have come through where, you know, use of force might have been justified, but our officers sought that level of, of separation, safety, communication, came to a positive end. So, uh, but unfortunately, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, police work is inherently ugly. You know, there are going to be times when somebody's not going to turn around and put their hands behind their back and is going to want to do us harm or do somebody else harm that unfortunately force might be necessary. But we're going to do everything we possibly can to hopefully not get there. Thank you. All right, our CIT response model. CIT, hopefully many of you are familiar with CIT. It's the Crisis Intervention Team Response Model. Um, basically, it's a it's it, it was developed under mental illness for law enforcement because as budgets were being cut in society under some of the mental health uh, and uh, hospital systems, you know, police are the ones who have to kind of or not kind of we are the ones that are thrust into those situations to deal with individuals in crisis. And when I say crisis, I kind of look at it more as not just mental illness or mental crisis. I look at it as societal crisis. You know, you. You're dealing with maybe, you know, somebody was killed, somebody died, and that person is in some level of, of anxiety and, and crisis. We need to know how to operate. Um, we have several police officers that are trained into the CIT model. We have every police officer that's trained under the mental health model so that we can help identify and bring together this collaborative process of, of connecting that individual with uh, the, the, the resources they need to hopefully help them work through that, whether it be mental health issues, whether it be uh, anxiety issues, those type of things. So that collaborative approach um, is important because we want to try and divert that person out of the criminal justice system. Arresting somebody, or what we used to say is you can't arrest your way out of every problem, right? If that's your go-to, then you're in the wrong business. We don't arrest our way out of problems. We need to figure out a way to work collaboratively with our other resources, town resources, county resources, state resources, to get that person diverted out of the criminal justice system. Um, I guess the most recent data, as this said, suggests that approximately 10% of all police contact with the public involves a person at some level of mental crisis. Um, we're going to get to a slide here in a, in a couple that talks about how much social work do we do. It, it's hard to separate the two of them, right? Because, you know, we may get a call of an individual standing um, in the middle of a road throwing bricks at cars. Well, that person might be in a level of mental health crisis, but what are they also doing? They're damaging other people's property. So we have to balance that and figure out how do we get this person help? How do we stop them from committing this, this you know, violation of law? And also get with the person who had their car damaged, how do we help them get made whole again also? So it is a balance and it's, it's very hard to separate the two. I have a quick question, Chief. Yes. <clears throat> um, do we have any social workers like a part of the Matthews Police Department? And also, are there any officers who are extensively trained in social work? Uh, that's kind of what I'm covering now, uh, okay. or, uh, Commissioner McCool, is the, the training is in the CIT model. The training is helping them identify and understanding what resources are out there. You know, typically, your, your layperson may not know what organization to go to if we have an elderly individual who is suffering from mental health crisis or is homeless. And, you know, who do we, who do we send them to? Somebody might know. Our CIT officers do. They will, they will get that person in contact. Uh, another success story, we got a call just the other week of an individual who is now was typically, if you will, never had any mental health issues. All of a sudden, that individual in our community is now suffering mental health issues. 
and the family member called and said, who do I talk to about getting my son or daughter some help? We put them in contact with a CIT officer who was helping them navigate that process to get them assistance so that we did not have to um, you know, bring that person into the criminal justice process. Uh, can I ask a couple questions? Sure. Um, the CIT officer is somebody within the department? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and, and how much training do they get to become a CIT officer? It is a 40 hour block of instruction put on by social workers, mental health professionals, and they actually go to locations where they um, interact with individuals in multiple different mental health crises or mental health diagnoses to make sure that they understand what they're looking for when they do that. It's a very extensive program and it's a nationally um, sought after and very highly uh, acclaimed program. How many hours total did you say? 40 hours for that. So and then you said there are also officers trained in mental health. Is that something they did through law enforcement training or is that something aside from? It is trained by social workers. Uh, we did that last year. We brought in the mental health first aid and trained every one of our police officers in mental health first aid, which is again, it's a, it's a beginning, if you will, course to the CIT because it doesn't get as in-depth as CIT. And, and the idea behind CIT is not every officer is, is apt to be a CIT officer, just like every officer isn't apt to be, you know, a corporal or a sergeant. But we try to identify those that um, are, empath are highly empathetic. Maybe they can work through the process uh, a little better than some of our others. That's their strength. And they are solicited to, and then they get trained as a CIT officer. And the mental health um, first aid is an eight-hour course. Is that? It is, it is an eight-hour course, yes. Do they do the one for children too, or just for adults? Uh, they, it's a it's a hybrid course of both. We also went through if you if you saw my email, I think I sent it out. Um, we talked about uh, we had eight hour block of instruction on officers dealing with um, children in a minority population. So we we try to to spread out our training to make sure that we're hitting every population we can. Okay, I'm, I've done the mental health for children, and that itself was an eight hour program. Um, it would be. And, and I, I don't know if it's free for the police department. The school system offers it for free. It is put on by the county and it is free to us. I think that would be beneficial for the department to do um, one specifically for children because and because it covers teenagers too. And, and it really, um, you know, has a, a unique system for, I mean, for high school kids. And I agree. And like I said, I know that they do that as a pro hybrid. You got to remember during our police academy, there's also 24 hours of mental health training and, and other aspects of it too. So I don't know if they take that as part of it, but I can I can look some do some research into that and look into it, but I appreciate it. Uh, all right, any other questions on that? So again, this is just showing you a little CIT, uh, certified officer 16 currently out of our 63. Um, allotted, if you will, mental health first aid, all. Now I say all, I will, I'll be honest, you know, we have hired a couple since that class. So there may be a few that need to go back through that or, or need to be hosted into that. Um, but for the most part, we required it as a 100% block for the organization. Uh, in 2018, there was communication skills with persons in crisis de-escalation techniques. Um, de-escalation, deliberate process that recognizes and preserves the rights of others understanding and compensates for basic human emotion in relation to illicit cooperation of the subject who's encountered by the officer. That's just the overview of what they did. Um, this was a four hour block, I believe, on de-escalation. Again, it's just maintenance. Um, they do get uh, de-escalation training in the academy. So implicit bias training, I'll talk, um, I'm sorry, any questions on that before I move on to implicit bias? Let me ask one more question. <laughs> Um, your CIT officers, do you always have somebody on duty that's a CIT officer? That's part of our deployment strategy. We try to split them up amongst all of our squads. Um, yes, right currently, I believe we have one on every single squad and in CID. Um, yeah, so we have, we, we're fairly distributed throughout the organization. And, and for the and board, less for the chief, uh, the county offers a, a CIT uh, mobile crisis unit but in talking to residents in Matthews more recently, um, I know some people who have called it and been told that the county doesn't come out to Matthews for crisis intervention. Uh, 
So I guess the, the burden is really put on our police department to be that response, which is, um, so it's important for us to know what you guys are doing for training in that realm. All right, our next area I'll cover. Chief, you know, Chief, yes, Chief, just quick. So why don't we check into that? Because if it's a county function, I, I mean, we're all paying county taxes. There, there'd be really no reason unless, unless it's duplicative. I, I'd like to hear the rationale why they're not coming. Renee, maybe I'll get a you and get a contact and track that down. I think I will, it's I because check. they're so stressed for um, for need that that they don't have the staff or the capacity to you know expand this far is really what it sounded like. I, I, I don't mean to I don't mean to you know contradict, but I will tell you um, most of the board is probably aware of the situation I'm going to talk about. But we had an individual in town who was under a severe level of mental crisis. Um, we contacted, it's called mobile crisis, uh, Ms. Garner, and we contacted them. They did come out. Um, so whether or not they just come out when we call them or whether they come out when a citizen calls them, I can't answer that. They did respond for an individual um, who uh, was in severe mental health crisis and was causing a lot of issues with stolen signs and things like that, that we they came out and they helped us with. I'm Thank not you, sure. Carl. You did. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, these This is two separate people with teenagers in crisis who needed help. Neither of those could get it from the mobile unit. So okay. um, I thank you for covering that in your department. I will, I will also follow up with the county too. Um, so implicit bias, um, the, the post, which is um, basically a certification body, this is all coming out of 21st century policing. Um, they want to ensure that basic recruits and in-service training incorporate this implicit, implicit bias training, which the town of Matthews does do this. We have uh, conducted cultural diversity training in 2016, 2018, and Tanya, if you're on, I want to say 2019, but it's it's one of those things I think that's pretty regular and don't quote me on the dates on that, but I know since I've been here, I've been through it. Um, we do train on leadership through community partnership. We train on communication skills with people in crisis. We train on strategies uh, and interactions with relationship with minority youth. We talk about equality policing. These are all classes that our officers have taken and unconscious bias training currently underway. Um, this is uh, something that's put on and was developed by the county. Uh, I sit on a board called the Criminal Justice Advisory Group um, the CJAG, the Criminal Justice Advisory Group, is consistent of every police chief or a designee, the courts, the county, um, county manager's office, city manager's office, um, RED, which is racial and ethnic um, diversity group, to make sure that we are uh, kind of figuring out how to deal with all of these issues as they come out. This is an unconscious bias training that is currently being developed and pushed out to every police department. And I believe every county employee uh, in the county is going to have to take this training and they're going to have to sign off on it. So we got the first one. We have been in contact with them. We're putting it on our uh, what we call power DMS, which is the way that we manage and track and hold accountable our employees for policies. Um, but this will be, again, another training that's going to be delivered. I've got a question, Chief. Is yes, uh, unconscious bias and implicit bias, are those terms used interchangeably? Does that mean the they same? are. I think this is just a new way of, of kind of clarifying what implicit is. It's, it's an unconscious thing that we do without knowing, so they are used synonymously. Thank you. At the request, I believe, of Ms. Garner, I wanted to kind of review the hours. I think the, the request or the, the, the ask was social work hours versus enforcement. Um, these are the number of hours for social work. I think you can take uh, the number of calls for service, for example, in 2018. Um, what we classify as social service, again, it's so hard to separate because what we do, we have to take off one hat and put on another constantly on the day um, to try to figure out how to, to best get help for this person. And we don't want to arrest our way out of everything. But if you notice in 2018, we had 588 calls for service. That's what CFS stands for. Um, to let you know, there were about 58,000 calls for service that year. Um, so 588 of those with an average minute of about 56 per call um, was dispensed. So you're looking at about an hour. So it's about 588 hours on just check on welfare, which means somebody maybe wasn't answering their door. Uh, a daughter or son in another state couldn't get a hold of their, their parent. They call us. We go by their house. We do a welfare check. Uh, mental health subject, somebody who might be 
You know, we, they want us to check their mental health. They want us to see if they're a danger to themselves or others, those type of things. Suicide attempts or suicides and missing persons. That's what we catalog or categorize, if you will, of social services. So you can kind of see the hours that we've expended in those. I also wanted to kind of give you an overview of where we are with domestic disputes. A lot of domestic disputes are individuals in crisis, right? It's a, it's a stressor that somebody might be unable to process and they start to take it out on a loved one. Um, but those are also criminal matters. Those are also things that our police officers are going to have to call, come and hold accountable to the individual who might have assaulted his loved one or, or, or her loved one inside the home. But that's that's just an overview. As we're looking at this, the you know the, the point in asking is when you decide you want to be a police officer, is this really what you're looking at when you're when you you know dedicate your life to something like this? Is this what you want to focus your time on? Or is it, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm asking in general, do you think that your officers would feel more relief if the town could find a better system to cover social services than relying on the police department for it? I would just argue that you're separating out now the need and the desire to have the police department part of the community, right? If only time we get called is to arrest or, um, you know, to take some enforcement action. That, that's not where you want your police department either. You don't want us just to be known up. Oh, there's the cop, right? We, we hate to hear a parent say, oh, be careful. I'm going to have that police officer arrest you to their child because that's not the image we want. We want right. them to know we're there to help them in whatever crisis they might be. We're, we're problem solvers, right? I mean, police department and police officers are problem solvers. To separate social work from enforcement is really an, un, in my opinion, is an unrealistic expectation because we have to work through the problem. What is it? Is it a mental health crisis? Here's the party you need to go to to get your assistance. What is it? Is it a, a runaway child, a, a child who keeps running away? The questions we ask in those is why are you running away? What is it that you're trying to get away from? Sometimes it's a defiant child, but sometimes it's evidence of maybe child abuse or child sex offense or something that we need to get. To. So to separate that from just call us for enforcement action really doesn't, uh, in my opinion, serve the public. That's what I was curious about, what that, what your perspective is on that. Thank you. Thank you. And just on that also, just know that sometimes social services will not show up if the police aren't even there, right? Just like sometimes fire department in the past has been, you know, the fire department wouldn't come until the police got there to make sure the scene was secure. I think it switched a little bit now with COVID. We don't go until the fire department's there to make sure it's safe for us to go into a house, but a um, little joke. All right, whoops, let me back that up a little bit. Final report on President's um, Task Force on 21st Century Policing does recommend community involvement in the process of developing and evaluating our policies and procedures. This is a direct quote from the 21st Century Policing. They recommend that we engage with our public to review our policies, to review our procedures, to make sure we're, we're doing and, and we're putting in place those processes that the community wants us to put in place. So the idea here is to form a chief's forum, to form a citizen advisory group or a citizen advisory committee that does evaluate and look at our departmental operational policies. How do we do things? How does that impact the public? What are your concerns with those? Let's say, for example, tomorrow I decide we need a drone program. You know, there's a lot of big brother concerns out there. What does the public feel about that? What is, how does the public want us to use it? Getting that feedback is important and that helps us build what we call legitimacy, and um, well, legitimacy in their eyes and trust that we're gonna do exactly what we say and they help watch those things. They want us, like you're bringing up, Ms. Garner, they need to tell us what training needs are. What is, these are hard questions we should be able to answer. What's your CIT program? How many officers do you have trained? What's the curriculum? Why do you only have 16? Why don't you have 63 and, and be able to answer those questions? But we need that feedback from this citizen advisory committee. And then ultimately we want to make sure that we're meeting our goals, right? I mean, recruitment efforts. Where do we recruit? What do we recruit? What's our demographics? How many people are we hiring? Um, what's our promotions? Do we have, um, not even what's our promotions, but what's our makeup, our demographic makeup? Uh, and then ultimately our complaint process, right? The, the things that you guys are talking about here with citizen advisories or citizen reviews is exactly what we're talking about with review our process. If our process doesn't make sense and you think there's a loophole citizen, we want you to audit that. We want you to provide us with that feedback. So this citizen advisory committee is something that we, we want them to audit this information. We want them to be involved. So um, that's something that we, we do propose and we have proposed and we're willing to, to kind of move forward with. 
As follow up to that, uh, again, these are action items that come out of this 21st century policing. Um, law enforcement agencies should encourage public engagement, collaboration, using the community advisory boards when developing policies for the use of new technology. If I'm gonna use a new technology, the citizens should know what's, what's out there. They should have input on how and when we use it. Law enforcement agencies should establish formal community advisory committees in developing crime prevention strategies and agencies policies, as well as providing input on policing issues, right? I mean, this is, this is 21st century policing. This is community oriented policing. If we're not soliciting feedback um, from a group of individuals from the community, both business, religious, and um, you know, citizenry, then, then I feel like we're missing our 21st century mark. So what's next? Um, we've talked about it here today. What's next is state and national accreditation. Not only are we gonna seek CALEA accreditation, which I've talked about here tonight, we're also gonna seek state accreditation. So the state is gonna have a accreditation process, which is gonna basically mirror the, the national accreditation process. So we would, heck, if we're gonna meet the, the national one, which is a lot more stringent, I believe, than the state's gonna be, we might as well go double bang for the buck on that one. Uh, application for accreditation will come up. Um, and it says police updates. That should say policy updates, I apologize. Policy updates are, we are going to continue to update our policies based on best practices, based on CALEA accreditation standards, based on state standards. Um, we're also going to seek community feedback, community meetings. Many of you have attended, uh, Chief Kinneberg and I do it once a year in every you know, beat inside the town. We wanna make sure that we are putting out what's our crime stats, what are, we, what are our challenges, what are our, our strengths, what are we looking for um, to move forward as an organization, whether it be a fire station, police station, additional um, resources or, or um, tools, if you will. And then the next thing that we are looking for is citizen advisory committee, you know, solicitation and application process, policy and practice review. We want them to audit, we want them to look at what we do and provide feedback, not only to us, but to, to the elected board. They should be also reporting out as any other advisory committee does on what their audit has found. Uh, and then that would start with monthly and quarterly meetings. Uh, and then obviously through conversations with the board and with Hazen, we would determine how that works. That's all I got, I hope, yep. Any additional questions or comments or concerns I'm open for. I, sorry, I didn't leave you a whole lot of time, but if there are any, I'd love to take them. Are there any uh, questions for Chief Pennington? I don't have a question, but I uh, more as a comment. Uh, Chief, I want to first commend you for having an action plan for your department. Uh, it shows where you were, where you're headed, and what improvements you made. And that's that's very important in this atmosphere that we're in now. And you and your department should be commended. And I'm 100% uh, on your side for what you presented tonight. And I, I think it's just very important going forward to the atmosphere of where we are. So I hats off to you and all of your, your employees and your staff. And I appreciate you saying that. Just to comment on what you said, Mr. Or, uh, Reverend Whitley, is you know under 21st century policing, it says that. You should be commending those organizations that are taking the appropriate steps. And honestly, Ford, I, I would love to see you guys sing our praises. You know, these officers are working their butts off every single day. And you know they need the support. They need to know that we are doing it right and they need to hear it from you. And, and that's kind of why I'm here to make sure that everybody has the information that, that we're not Minneapolis. You know, we are, we are taking those steps to make sure that we are inclusive. We are taking those steps to make sure we're transparent, but we do need the support, um, which helps raise morale um, with some of the things we've been going through these last few months um, is tough. But we know that Matthews Police Department is not represented by what you've seen nationally. That's right. I think that's a, like, go ahead. Uh, just as a quick aside, um, again, I, I have complete confidence in your department and I know, you know, just a handful of police officers and, and believe you all are doing an exceptional job um, and that Matthews is what, when we talk about what policing should be, Matthews is heading, is already that. Um, so, but I don't know how we as a board um, can really get that across to your officers. So, you know, if it's you passing along that we have this level of confidence uh, or if you have other ways that, that we can do that, please let me know. Well, I, I think honestly, the, the message publicly should be as 
Commissioner Whitley talked about, you know, and as 21st century policing talks about, we should be actively commending and, and using the Matthews Police Department as what it should be. What should a police department look like? It should look like this. I, I get the national conversation is what it is, but the local conversation from our local board, I hope that you guys see that we're doing everything we possibly can to make you proud, to make our citizens proud, and to hold up with the honor and integrity that these officers carry every day with them when they put on this, this uniform that they're proud to wear. Chief, I'd like to reiterate some of the things that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner and, and Commissioner Whitley said. And I'd also like to say that I've been an elected official and entering my seventh year. I know Commissioner Urban, you've been four terms, correct? And, and Jeff Miller, you've been around forever. And let me just say this, I, five terms. So when we look at um, when all of us, especially uh, Commissioners Miller and Urban that have been around for a long time, certainly for myself, when I look at um, the number of complaints we, we have received about police officers compared to the number of uh, accommodations or, or, or text or messages from citizens saying how awesome the police are, you know, it's way weighted towards complimentary, very, very few, maybe a handful since I've been an elected official and I can ever remember anybody saying anything negative. So I think the community at large also very much appreciates what you're doing and I think you're doing a fantastic job. Would anybody else like to say something? We're quickly running out of time here. I, Mayor, I got a quick comment. So it did sound like the one, the one to do was for us to go back and evaluate complaints and how, what's the proper channel to be both transparent and you know, meet the law that we can report back to you kind of the, the category, broad category of complaints. But, the, but that was the only to-do note that I took. Yeah, I, I, I didn't have any problem with the transparency. Um, make sure I'm not muted. I didn't have any problem with the transparency. I just thought that the frequency should be more, more yeah, be yeah, more than annual. We'll kind of figure out a plan. We'll bring you back a plan. I guess that's what I would say for y'all to look at. Uh, hey, so I, also, I, I would like to know all of the attorneys that are hired by the town of Matthews, who they are, and if we're paying them some money, I like to know how much anger. I know what Charlie's is, and I know what Scott's. I think is nine. Uh, but I think Attorney Fox, do we pay him anything or not? But just all of the attorneys that the town, and it's good to have these different attorneys. I'm not not complaining. I'm just want for information as a commission to know that we do have these people in place that specify for certain types of things. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Good job, Chief. Thanks, sir. Yeah, I, I show the time is 657 and I think uh, Commissioner Urban was looking out his window. I'm looking out a window and yeah, the storm is a brewing, I can tell you. <laughs> right. I'm gonna run out and roll up my off, windows. What do we do? If the power goes out, we get knocked off. Like I, I got knocked off for a minute ago. What do we do? If, uh, if you get knocked out, try as best as you can to come back on. You might need to use a cell phone if your power goes out. And depending on how long it takes you, that will determine whether you're admitted back in as an acting member or if you might just have to be off. So we'll okay. know when you leave and if and when you come back. Okay, thanks. Thank you. If anybody wants to take a very quick break, we've got about two, two and a half minutes. If you want to run to the restroom or...
The public that may be watching, we just concluded a 5.30 meeting and we're taking a very brief break. So we may be starting a minute or two late. I'd like to ask the commissioners as you are uh, available, please uh, turn your cameras and on so we can see you. Laura, are you on? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to the June 22nd, 2020 Matthews Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, we just did conclude a, a 5.30 meeting with our Chief of Police, Chief Pennington, who uh, reviewed some of the police policies, and uh, that was a very good review. We appreciate that. I'd like to do some uh, introductions before we get started. Uh, as far as the elected officials, we have Commissioner Larry Whitley. Uh, Good Commissioner evening. Dave, Commissioner Dave Bland. Commissioner John Urban. Mayor Pro Tem Renee Garner. Commissioner Miller. And Commissioner Ken McCool. I don't know why I didn't say your first name, Jeff. Commissioner Jeff Miller. Not too many of those. We have uh, uh, some town officials and a special guest also tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Lucia Paulson, who is an intern with Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Uh, she is a rising freshman at Butler High School, and I commend her for her interest in uh, these types of meetings. I've, I've told some people in the past that my father used to, I think, punish my brother and I and force us to watch uh, Mecklenburg County commissioner meetings and school board meetings, and maybe that's why I ended up as mayor. But uh, it's unusual for someone your age, Lucia, to have an interest in town government. So we applaud that. I'd like to uh, also introduce some other town staff we have with us. Uh, town Manager Hazen Blodgett, Assistant Town Manager Becky Hawk, uh, Town Clerk Lori Canapino, Planning Director Jay Camp, uh, Chief Police Chief Pennington. Uh, HR Director Tanya McGovern and Communications Coordinator Maureen Keith and I apologize if I'm missing anyone. All right. Due to the Mecklenburg County's COVID-19 Safer at Home order, this meeting of the Matthews Board of Commissioners will be conducted remotely using the Zoom virtual meeting platform. The Town of Matthews is committed to transparency and robust public participation during these challenging times. I will remind uh, the elected officials, of uh, myself and the commissioners, we will vote on each item by roll call vote, meaning each member will be polled to individually state their vote for the record. They will also raise their hand to visually indicate their vote. So with that being said, I'd like to ask uh, Commissioner Jeff Miller to give the invocation or moment of reflection for this evening. For those who choose to share in prayer, let us bow our heads. Dear God, you have said that where two or more are gathered in your name, that you will be with them. We ask you to be with us now, bless us and provide guidance to the Matthews Town Council with the business brought before us tonight. May we prove worthy of the confidence placed in us by our fellow citizens. May we be honest in our actions and make the best decisions, not only for today, but for the years to come. We thank you for our civil liberties and freedoms, for our privileges and our opportunities. Freedom is not free, so please keep watch over the men and women in the military, police and fire departments as they serve and protect all of us. Amen. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Uh, 
as, as I'm speaking now, I'm looking out of uh, uh, my office window and there's quite a storm here in Matthew. So let's hope that we don't get uh, knocked off the air, so to speak. I'd like to go on uh, to agenda item number three and that's the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now we'd like to go on to agenda item number four, and that is to recognize National Pollinator Week. Uh, we have uh, my friend Gretchen Reed here, chair of B City USA. Uh, Lori, can you uh, put place the proclamation up? And I am unable to see it. Hold on one second, please. I'd like to uh, read this into the record and. and uh, again, we have Gretchen here uh, with B-City USA. In recognition of National Pollinator Week, whereas pollinator species such as thousands of species of bees are essential partners in producing much of our food supply, and whereas pollinator species provide significant environmental benefit that are necessary for maintaining healthy, diverse urban and suburban ecosystems, and whereas pollination plays a vital role for the trees and plants in our community, enhancing our quality of life and creating recreational and economic development opportunities. And whereas for decades, the town of Matthews has managed urban landscapes and public lands that include many municipal parks and greenways, as well as wildlife habitats. And whereas the town of Matthews provides recommendations to developers and residents regarding landscaping to promote wise conservation stewardship, including the protection of pollinators and maintenance of their habitats in urban and suburban environments, now, therefore, I, John F. Higdon, Mayor of the Town of Matthews, do hereby proclaim the week of June 22nd through the 28th, 2020, as National Pollinator Week in the Town of Matthews and urge all citizens to recognize this observance. So, uh, Gretchen, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you. As chair of B City USA for the Town of Matthews, I did want to thank the town um, for their continued passion and the actions behind that passion around limiting pesticide use, um, the community opportunity to continue to um, educate our population and inspire them around beekeeping and our pollinators as well. And the support of things like the Country Place Garden that will be spotlighted both within our um, Facebook for the uh, Bee City USA, you can find it there. And then I also thank the Matthews Beacon for as well, spotlighting some different areas around town to enjoy pollinators. It's a little different this year um, as we all are virtual. Um, so you'll be a lot, see a lot of things on social media, but then as things open up, we hope to engage with the public through some of our booths and observation hives and things like that, that you'll see around town. So just wanted to thank the town again for their commitment and enthusiasm and curiosity too in, on this topic. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, many of you know that I'm a beekeeper. I use that term lightly because you really don't keep bees. I, I know uh, our town manager, Hazen Blodgett, also is a beekeeper and, and uh, one of our other guests tonight, former Mayor Lee Myers, is a beekeeper. Uh, I do have a hive at uh, the Purser Halsey Community Garden if anybody would like to go see what a hive looks like in action. Just don't get too close. So, but thank you very much, Gretchen. We appreciate it. Thank you. Going to move on to item five, and uh, I do want to recognize uh, some very special guests that we have with us tonight. Probably the, the one of the only times that we've had the last, including myself, four mayors, myself and three former mayors, um, participate in a meeting. We have uh, former mayor Lee Myers. Welcome, Lee. We also have former Mayor Jim Taylor, and I believe uh, former Mayor Paul Bailey as well. I, I uh, can't see him on my screen, but I, I believe he's with us as well. And we're all here for a very special reason, and that is to recognize and honor All right, Renee, I think you got to step in. I think we've lost the mayor. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> All right, let me start over. Again, apologize, there's quite a storm blowing through and my internet may not be pristine. 
Tonight, we honor retiring Novant Health Matthews Medical Center President and Chief Operating Officer Roland Bebo. Roland has served as the Chief Operating Officer of Novant Health Matthews since 2008. I've had the great privilege of working with him and getting to know him over the years. There are not many who have done more for Matthews than Roland. He cares deeply for the community and he is greatly respected by all that know him. Roland has collaborated with the town on many projects over the years. He has led efforts that have greatly benefited our community. I think about Novant's support of Matthews Alive over the years and their generous donation to equip Engine 22 for the Matthews Fire and EMS and, and many others that I'm sure our former mayors are gonna touch on. He is truly a fantastic community partner. Roland is also involved in many nonprofit organizations all over town, including the Matthews Health Center, the Matthews Free Medical Clinic, and Levine Senior Center. So tonight we wanna to take some time to offer our great thanks and gratitude to Roland and wish him all the best in retirement. And on a, on a very personal note, I'd like to say that uh, shortly after I was elected mayor, I was very shortly, I was asked to speak at Novon at their great uh, tree lighting um, that they have every year. And it's a, a, a very, um, let me just say hectic event. There's a lot of people. It's a wonderful event. It's a beautiful introduction to the Christmas season. And as one of my first duties as mayor, it, again, it was a little bit, uh, a little hectic. And I was happy to see a, a, a smiling friend and Roland come up and reassure me and tell me where to stand and make sure the mic was turned on and that I didn't make a fool out of myself uh, at, at the very first time I spoke as mayor. And that's really been the case always, Roland. Anytime I've ever had interactions with you when I've spoken at Veterans Day events or, or Matthews Alive events or anything that you were involved, you have a very calming presence and you're always smiling, make everybody feel at home and welcome. And we're very thankful for that. So I'd like, now I have the great honor of uh, turning the mic over to uh, former Mayor Lee Myers, who would like to say a few words. Mayor Myers. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I, I want to thank um, Presbyterian Hospital and, and Novant. Uh, several years ago, 25 or 30, uh, they had confidence in Matthews and Matthews had confidence in them. Dave Bland and Charlie Buckley were integral parts of bringing the hospital to Matthews back in those years, provided that leadership to make that possible. Over the years, we've had great leadership in, at the Matthews Hospital. Billings, uh, Paula Vincent, a lot of folks have come forward, but absolutely without question, uh, Roland has set the bar extremely high. Uh, Harry Smith, I communicated with Harry, who is uh, Roland's immediate report to at Novant, uh, and, and it's gonna be very difficult to replace uh, Roland Bebo and what he has done. Roland and Lou, Roland is Lou there somewhere? I left her a message and said, we didn't really, all right, all right. We, we've got the team here, uh, there. Lou, good evening to you and thank you for joining us. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna say that, you know, Roland will tell you in every other sentence is the word team. That is a commitment of his, uh, and that's what Roland talks about a lot. I had the privilege of serving with Roland Bebo for the last uh, few years that I served as mayor. And then for the last 10 years, I've worked with Roland as a member of the board of trustees for Novant. Roland and I have had a great relationship through those years. Roland's number one commitment is to his team. After his family, it's his family at Novant, the nurses. I mean, people from the doctors all the way down are the people that Roland focuses on because he knows his second commitment is to those people in our community who need great health care. And so Roland has that team in place and has maintained that team throughout to provide a great health care provider to our folks here in the town of Matthews and in our greater community. Um, and thirdly, Roland has been an influence in our community in many other ways. I know Jim Taylor will touch on some of this and uh, John mentioned it before. 
Matthew's alive, something that's been very important to me over the years. And Roland has stepped up and has embraced Matthew's Alive as a premier community event and has made that possible over these last many years. With the support of Novant, people like Harry Smith, we will continue what Roland Bebo has carried forward. So what I wanna say, Roland and Lou, is thank you all so much. And I consider you to be not only just a professional friend of mine, but a friend. And I appreciate that. And you will never, ever be forgotten by any of us on this call or the town of Matthews. And we're going to keep kissing those babies when they're born at Novon in the Women's Center. We're going to keep them coming, and we're going to provide that great level of service. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, for letting me have a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Lee. It really means a lot. And uh, obviously to be here this evening with my wife is um, even more special. So uh, thank you. Thank you again. You've been a great partner, a great friend, and uh, I'm just happy to be here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> so I think the mayor has lost, the mayor's no longer on the call. <laughs> so That's I think we're going to go. My year, I'll tell you, it's been yeah. a challenging year, hasn't it? It's been a tough year. It, well, hey, Haven, Mayor, former Mayor Taylor, speak next. <laughs> well, uh, Lori, can am I on screen? Yes, sir. Perfect. Well, for, first of all, thank you everybody for allowing me the opportunity to participate in this uh, tribute to the face of Novant, uh, the Matthews Medical Center, Roland. Uh, before I go into um, uh, hopefully no more than five minutes, according to Lori's uh, restrictions. Uh, I'm here, <laughs> I'm here uh, in two roles. Number one, um, three roles actually. Number one, to honor Roland through my experience as mayor of the wonderful town of Matthews, but also as a board member of, the, of Matthews Alive, which is, uh, as, as Lee mentioned, is very special to, to he and I and, and many of us here in town, um, but also as a friend. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna start with the friendship part first, but I wanna share my screen with everybody. Uh, so Lori, if I screw this up, please let me know, but I'm gonna go share my screen. Um, I'm gonna do this and hopefully you guys can see my screen, correct? You see a Zoom screen? Yes. Okay. Um, Lou, uh, uh, Roland, are, is Lou still on with you? She is. Well, 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 wonderful, great. Everybody, uh, I'm sure many of you know, and uh, I do know this, but uh, Lou and uh, Roland celebrated something very special this past year. Uh, his partner in crime, her partner in crime have been married for 39 years. And I wanted to share a very special picture with you guys of our wonderful couple. Wow. Uh, they look like babies, don't they? <laughs> to be young again. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, I think both of you look terrific, as terrific today as you did way back then. Uh, and first of all, uh, from, my, from, from me, congratulations. Here's to another 39 years uh, together. And um, hopefully when you get down to Florida, you can relax a little bit and all the pressure of running the, 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 the premier community hospital here in North Carolina, uh, you can relax a little bit, Roland, and uh, treat your beautiful wife to uh, many, many beautiful sunsets on the West Coast. Um, so now let me get back to the topic of this evening, and I'm going to stop try to unshare my screen here. So honey, hang on, I got to get back to Zoom. Uh, are we there yet? There we go. There's Roland. Perfect. Okay. First of all, Roland, you and I have have been on many many boards together. The Community Health Alliance that you put together to make sure that Matthews and Mint Hill and the surrounding area were were were, were, were the hospital was was meeting the requirements and the needs of the community. That was a tremendous uh, effort on your behalf. And I, I, uh, I, I enjoyed every one of those meetings. And I think we did well. And we finally disbanded that group because we had achieved our, our mission. We completed our mission. So that was wonderful. Um, you were on so many boards, the Matthews Free Medical Clinic. The Matthews Free Medical Clinic um, would not be in its facility today for a number of things. Much of that because of you and your relationship with them and working with the doctors that are there and the interaction with the hospital. The Matthews Health Center, which I will 
circle back around because we're still involved in that. Um, mm -hmm. And the Levine Senior Center. Uh, many of you may or may not know uh, Roland was the, uh, the chair of the Levine Senior Center Board of Directors. And the town of Matthews and the Levine Senior Center worked together to make sure that we could uh, solidify that structure, that function, that, that, that need in the community forever. Um, uh, I think Roland was probably about four or five years ago, uh, you were the chair. And I'm gonna tell a little story here really quick. Um, I was in Orlando, I believe at either, I think it was Universal. And it was the middle of the summertime. And uh, I get a phone call from Roland Bebo in the middle of the afternoon while I'm on vacation. And he calls and he's telling me something uh, about the details of the, of the um, Levine Center that we were in sort of in trouble a little bit. And we had had some background conversations. Well, that little call got me in a lot of trouble with my wife and my kids because mm -hmm. I think 45 minutes to an hour later, I'm still on the phone in, or, in Orlando and we're trying to figure out a solution. Um, and if it wasn't for the leadership of Roland uh, and, and, and guiding the Levine Center through and with the help of the Matthews Town Board uh, and trying to come up with a creative solution, we weren't trying to circumvent anything. We talked to Charlie, got some legal advice as to what our, our options were and working together, we solved that problem. And that senior center now is on much better footing than it was way back then. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, 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 the debt that was drowning them, the mortgage payment is gone. The town owns the building and the, and the, and the land, but the senior center provides a service. And we, we have guaranteed that to, to go on for many, many years. So thank you for that, Roland. It's a wonderful thing. You've been an in integral part of the Matthews Chamber of Commerce over the years, and I, I think they, they owe you a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude for that. Um, I, I tried to jot down a whole bunch of the accomplishments that you had at the, at the hospital, the fifth floor expansion, the women's center, the, the cath lab uh, um, expansion. That facility is nothing what it was like 12 or 13 years ago when you joined the organization here in Matthews. And that was probably one of the best things that ever happened. Um, like Lee mentioned, uh, I think I know every one of the administrators that have come through Matthews and by far every one of them was excellent in their own little way and, and moved Matthews and moved the hospital further along. But Roland, you, you are the crowning jewel. You are the face of that hospital. And I am proud, to, I am very proud to have known you and worked with you to make the hospital better, the town better and working together. And another one of the accomplishments that we did together, and again, it was, was, this was with your leadership, the Matthews Fire Department was able to uh, secure some fire equipment um, that we didn't have the funding to do. Uh, and you realized and Novant realized through the foundation that that is to help the community. And we were able to make that happen. Um, you were there You were there for the 20th anniversary when I had the privilege of giving you a proclamation and a, uh, for the hospital, a key to the city. Uh, that was a very proud day. Uh, my, my weather warnings are going off. There's a very severe storm, as we all know, outside my window. I was planning to do this from the comfort of my deck earlier, and now I'm inside. Um, you were there for the 20th anniversary. You were there for the 25th anniversary. And those are phenomenal, because I remember back when, and Lee, you'll remember this too, and Charlie and David, we didn't have a hospital here in Matthews. Um, and what, we, what, the, what, what the hospital brought to the town of Matthews made it much more relevant, made it much more of a player in the larger scheme of things. And as the hospital grew, the town of Matthews grew. So all the ancillary things around the hospital, the doctor's office, offices, et cetera, made Matthews an even better place to live uh, and, and work and play. And I'm very happy and proud of, of all of that. Uh, I'm gonna shift gears now onto the Matthews Alive side, putting my Matthews Alive board of directors hat on. Roland, you are the best face of Novant for Matthews Alive. I get up, I used to get up on stage all the time and talk about all of our sponsors. And the one key difference between Novant and the sponsors were you were a true partner. The hospital, you and Harry and everybody else knew how the, the hospital was the center part, the kingpin of the community. And you step forward every single time and thank you, thank you, thank you. We thank you, we owe you a huge debt of gratitude from the Matthews Alive board. And um, one other thing for everybody on the call, you may or may not have known, Roland was going to be honored as our Grand Marshal of the parade this year, but we have obviously canceled the parade, so Roland's off the hook, so to speak. <laughs> but we will figure out what we're gonna do to honor you from a Matthews Alive standpoint. But we, uh, 
whatever we do will not be enough. Uh, and uh, we, we appreciate the relationship, the partnership, and the friendship you've had with Matthews Alive. Um, I want to make sure I don't miss anything, although I don't want I know I'm going long. I do want to talk about a couple of other things because we've worked together, Lee and I, and I'm sure many of the others on the call, we supported the hospital with your certificates of need. We've written letters. We've spoken in front of, um, uh, of, of the, the governing board to try to allow get more ED space, um, more bed space in the hospital, um, et cetera. And again, that's the, the wonderful relationship that we have had over the many, many years between the governing body of the town of Matthews, not only from the mayor's office, but the board of commissioners, the staff, and you and your leadership team over there at, at Matthews, uh, Ma um, Matthews Medical Center. I do want to talk about one last thing, and this has nothing to do with Roland's excellent leadership of the hospital, his commitment to the town of Matthews, or anything like that, but Roland has compassion. Roland is a wonderful, wonderful, compassionate person. And um, as somebody who's had, um, this is a little bit of a personal story, so from somebody who has had the joys of having my second child born at the Matthews Hospital, and my father pass away at the Matthews Hospital. I have seen both sides coming into this world and leaving this world. And um, uh, my father-in-law as well was in that hospital for an extended period of time. And he's an old Air Force guy. And Roland is an Air Force guy. And those two guys clicked like there was no tomorrow. And uh, I still hear to this day, um, although they don't refer to him as Roland, they refer to him as Bebo. How's Bebo doing? So uh, you left a lasting impression. And again, I'm sure that lasting impression has been left with a number of people that you have interacted with over the years. And it's just, it's just the ability that people think they're being heard and being listened to. And you are tremendous at that. So thank you very, very much. Um, with that, Roland, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yield my time. I think Paul is going to talk a little bit about it. But first of all, congratulations. Uh, I've, I've cherished our interaction, our working relationship, uh, our friendship over the years. Um, I don't know if you're going to switch from being a Patriots fan to being a Bucks fan now, since your your buddies are all down south, and you're down south. Uh, but uh, uh, I predict if the Bucks go to the Super Bowl, you will be there. Anyway, congratulations! Thank you everybody for allowing me this opportunity. Roland, your class act, and uh, tell 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 uh, tell Lou. I know she's left. Tell her congratulations as well and to enjoy your retirement. And I'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Jim. Thank I, you, Jim. I, um, I, I got knocked off by the storm. I, my son's at home. And I said, what happened? And he said, we have no internet. So I'm on, a, I'm on a hot spot right now. I do have one question. Where the heck is Lee sitting, but the sun is shining? <laughs> is that a virtual <laughs> yeah. background? Or, or just like the glow always follow the great Lee Myers around and you have this sunshine that's, halo? That's, that's the way it is in Matthews, right? Sunshine <laughs> all the time. I would like to ask a question. I'd, when the meeting's over, Lori, I'd like to know how much time Mayor Taylor took up there, okay? I want, that's, I want to know how much time. I think I need to I, I, had two, I had two roles, Lee. I had two roles, two roles. So, so you were on a roll. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, I had right. my money on you over Jim tonight. I, I know. Well, you... <laughs> I was I was only gone for a minute or two and Lee was finished. It was amazing. Uh, I'd like to hey, go on I, with I, a, I, I learned from the best. I'd like to go on with a, a, another tribute from uh, former mayor Paul Bailey. Do I have there. any do I have any time left? No, sure. Sure. of course you do. <laughs> um thank you, John, and, and thank you, the council and to Roland for allowing me to be part of this uh, recognition. You know, 30 years ago when the hospital opened, I remember going on the, the tour. And um, when I walked into one of the operating rooms, there was a roast beef sitting there on the surgery table. And I thought this is gonna be a fun time to have the hospital, Presbyterian Hospital at that time in Matthews. And uh, it has been a wonderful relationship uh, Roland, you have done so much for the town uh, personally, and Novant has done so much for the town. And, and uh, Jim and Lee went through all of that. But what I wanted to do was to focus more on uh, the Roland Bebo that I've gotten to know uh, through other activities. Um, I, I was kidding Roland 
a couple of weeks ago about uh, every Zoom call I'm on, Roland's on there. And yet again, here tonight, here he is again. And uh, uh, it's because I have gotten to know Roland through Rotary. And Roland is a participant in Matthews Helping Matthews, raising money for the Help Center. And Roland Bebo as an individual uh, is the kind of person that you want in a community. And he has done so much through Rotary, not only helping Matthews nonprofits with our spaghetti dinners and the other things that we do, but also Rotary International that does a lot for folks around the world. And uh, Hazen's uh, part of our group as well. And uh, Roland's been an integral part of that. I get to be the incoming president uh, in two weeks or one week, I guess. And, uh, and I was looking for, forward to having Roland there, but uh, uh, I know you're going to start the trip up the second mountain here as you, as you go into retirement and uh, find new things to do. And I'm sure as an individual knowing you, uh, you're going to uh, move to Florida and you're going to make an impact on that community as well. And uh, uh, I've certainly appreciated everything you've done for Matthews as a leader at Novant, but I also want to tell you that I've certainly enjoyed getting to know you and value as a friend, and I wish you the best of luck uh, in your retirement. Thank, Thank you. you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. It means a lot, both what you and Jim and certainly Lee at it. Um, I, hope, I hope my wife's trying to get me some tissues. I hope I don't need them. Well, one of the uh, um, realities of our current situation is I have to do something extremely awkward now. And that is on behalf of all uh, the, the town board and myself and all the mayors that have assembled here tonight and for my, all of the citizens of the town of Matthews Roland, I'd like to present you virtually with a key to the town of Matthews. So congratulations. And uh, Roland, if you would like to say a few words, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> certainly on behalf of the uh, Navon Health family, because um, without that family, uh, certainly at Matthews and beyond, um, I just happen to be the right person at the right place and just being able to potentiate uh, what we mean to the community. And uh, as Jim said earlier, it's, uh, I thought it was pretty cool to uh, get a key for, for Matthews Medical Center to the town of Matthews. Now it's even cooler um, that for me to receive that personally. I don't know if that fits the, the key entry into town hall, Hazen, and, and I know the chief of police is on. He, he's probably going to put an outlook for me. There's no doubt about that. But really, um, it, I'm, I'm glad that Lee, thank you for calling my wife Lou, because truthfully, uh, you know, and I know um, that behind every successful person, whether it's a man or female, there's, there's an even bigger person behind us. And for my wife and I, who celebrated 39 years and, you know, been together 40 plus, it truly is a proud moment. And for the opportunity to make a difference in our community. Uh, and as uh, if Harry was on the line, um, the last document that I will deliver to him uh, at the end of this week will be the plan for Matthews Medical Center for the next 10 to 15 years of how I believe that our medical center ought to continue to grow to meet the needs of our community. Um, and, and I think as Jim said, one thing I've cherished the most in my job um, is connecting with our patients, with our families, and ultimately with our team members that deliver that remarkable care every day. Part of that was ingrained to me from my parents. A lot of it was ingrained to me in my military service in the Air Force, Force but most importantly, um, it's what I've captured over my 40 plus years in the healthcare business of, it is about our patients. And if you stay focused on that, uh, good things will happen to you. So certainly on behalf of my family and myself, and Novant Health, thank you for, for the kind recognition. Um, and, and I think everyone would attest this virtual world, it's not, it, it's been a, even a challenge for me, even though I've become pretty, pretty adept at Zoom. 
Um, I'm a kind of personal touchy guy that I like to create that personalized relationship. Uh, and this Zoom certainly has been a challenge for us. And even as my team struggled to how to, how to celebrate uh, for me, they've been challenged that, um, how do you do that virtually? But obviously, as, as you mentioned, I challenged the team this year when they said we don't, we can't do our Memorial Day as it normally was, because obviously it's one of my favorite events. I reached out to Lee, I reached out to others and said, we're gonna do a virtual uh, Memorial Day. And thankfully our RT team rallied around me because I was pretty clear I'm gonna do it with or without you. I'll, I'll go find a video team that's gonna do it. And thankfully all the participants made it happen. But it really goes back to the town of Matthews and everyone on the call tonight. Um, the partnership has been amazing. And uh, obviously it's Harry's job now to uh, find someone that uh, certainly can fill my shoes uh, but more importantly, to continue to support our team and what they do every single day. And certainly this pandemic has stretched our team far beyond what I've seen in my career, but they've continued to do it with professionalism, with a smile, because you know and I know it gets more and more dis difficult as we loosen uh, social uh, distancing, masking and things of this sort, that it's gonna continue to ramp up, but again, I'm, I'm probably like Jim and, um, and, and Lee a little bit. I'm trying not to be long-winded, but thank you again for allowing me to participate tonight. Thank you for the key to the great town of Matthews. It will always be treasured in my, my household. And Jim Taylor, if, uh, if, if you offer me to come back to Matthews Alive, I'll find my way back here one way or another. Great. So thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the time. One final note, Roland, I think you should know that I did consult with Charlie Buckley to see if I could prevent you from retiring by executive decree, but he said that was <laughs> not, not allowed by the law. He could do that. It's looking like a true attorney. Thank you. Uh, as, a, uh, as a final tribute, I've asked uh, Lori to go ahead and read the words that are on the key that we're presenting tonight. This is a proclamation and it reads as follows. Whereas Roland R. Bibu has served the greater Matthews community as president and chief operating officer of Novant Health Matthews Medical Center since 2008. And whereas as an Air Force medic, Roland served his country by caring for wounded service members. And whereas Roland received a nursing degree and continued his service caring for the medical needs of his patients. And whereas Roland's career has taken him to various medical establishments culminating in his position as president and COO of Novant Health Matthews Medical Center. And whereas, Roland has been a visionary in the community with a commitment to collaborative work with the town of Matthews and innumerable service organizations throughout the area. And whereas, Roland's actions have improved the lives of countless people in Matthews and the greater community. And whereas, Roland truly cares about the community and is greatly respected by all who know him. And whereas, the town of Matthews wishes to pay tribute to Roland Arbibu and extend congratulations and sincere best wishes for a joyful retirement. And proclaimed that as an expression of gratitude for Roland Bibu's contrib contributions to the community, he is awarded a key to the town of Matthews and proclaimed we, the mayor and board of commissioners of the town of Matthews, take pride and pleasure in joining the many family, friends, and members of the community at large in congratulating him as he retires from a lifetime of service to others. Fantastic. Yay. Thank you so much, Roland. Yay. <laughs> Don't be a stranger. We expect to see you here often. Absolutely. Thank you, team. Appreciate it. Have a great night. Appreciate what everyone does for this great town of Matthews. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you, Roland. Thank, thank, thank you, Roland. Thank you, everybody. Thank as you, as you as Paul. Appreciate it. All right, we'll move on to the next agenda item, and that is to receive an update on COVID-19. Tonight, we're gonna to receive this from Town Manager Hazen Blodgett. All right, members of the board, mayor, members of the board, thanks uh, for the time. Um, so we're in day 103 of the activation of the er Emergency Operation uh, Command Center there uh, at Mecklenburg County. Uh, as of this morning, we had 8,346 county cases, 142 deaths, 
Over the last two weeks, cases have increased 56%, deaths have increased 25%. Uh, we're averaging um, uh, 2,375 COVID tests a day. Uh, and we're averaging 214 in new positive tests a day. The previous two weeks was 174. The positive testing is hovering around, uh, those that are tested, the positive testing is hovering around 10%. There's a 32% increase in hospitalizations, a 3% increase in COVID patients on ventilators. The socially, social distancing index has steadily decreased to approximately 30 since the high of 70 at the beginning of April. Um, there are 79 residents of Matthews with COVID in 17 locations. Uh, 16 of those locations, there's 20 people in, and then one of the locations there's 59 in, and that is Royal Park that is still in outbreak status. Um, uh, Mecklenburg County has seen an increase in the percent of total cases experienced by 20 to 39 year olds. And the, one of the big unanswered questions is what's the impact of the protests and gatherings going to have on community spread? And those folks are still in the incubation period. Uh, the second big question is will the governor require masks or some kind of facial covering to be war worn? Several cities. Uh, in counties in Mecklenburg County, I mean, in North Carolina have, have done that. Mecklenburg County is discussing that uh, issue on several, several levels. We have discussed, we discussed, well, we mentioned it today on the countywide policy call. That's a group made up of man county, man county and town managers, uh, city manager, uh, representatives from the hospitals, uh, and other, other, other emergency responders. Uh, you know, we've gone through phase one, we went through a modified phase two. Uh, the original was to begin phase three on the 26th. I, I, don't, I don't know what the governor's going to do. Um, some of the things that are going on in town, uh, we worked with Mecklenburg Finance and we're seeking reimbursement for COVID related uh, expenditures. And we put in money not only for town expenditures, but they asked for the help center because the help center's mission fits very well with some of the folks in need, whether whether it's food insecurity or uh, housing, rental, uh, or mortgage payments, and then utility payments as well. Uh, we have reopened town hall, uh, town facilities. We are bringing back employees uh, on a regular basis. However, we are also letting folks work from home. Uh, and we're making sure everybody respects social distancing. Uh, we're con we continue to um, engage in countywide efforts. We were represented on the business roundtable. Uh, the chiefs work with um, PPE uh, inventory, um, and then they're working with the local co congregate care facilities, and we're represented on the county EOC. So this is, uh, I'm the proxy for uh, Chief Kenneberg, but I'll do my best to answer any questions you all may have. If um, I, I could say a few words, I would appreciate it. This is in regards to uh, face masks. And I think everybody's aware that uh, should the county put in a, a proclamation or a mandate that, that all of the uh, all of the county uh, abide by wearing face masks indoors where social distancing can be uh, respected. It does require the signature of all the mayors. And I've been asked uh, as mayor what my opinion is of that. And I, I would support um, requiring wearing, albeit it's not enforceable, but you know having a proclamation or a mandate that would require wearing masks when indoors, like in, in grocery stores and things like that. Um, I do not support Matthews having a standalone mandate where we would just on our own uh, say you have to wear masks if you're in Matthews for a couple reasons. I think it would have some unintended consequences. Number one, it would kind of uh, upset the, this relationship that we're trying to maintain with the county where we're working together. We're working in lockstep together. Uh, Number two, it, it could possibly have unintended consequence of 
having certain numbers of people say, well, fine, I'll just go do my business in Mint Hill or Charlotte, and it could cost our, our businesses um, some customers. So for those two reasons, I don't. However, I would support a resolution requiring a, requiring at the saying that telling the county that we support uh, their efforts in this vein. And, and if they if they were to uh, push this, the, the town of Matthews would support it. Now, of course, I would like to get everybody else's opinion. We have drafted a, such a resolution, a resolution in support of requiring face coverings to be worn in Mecklenburg County during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we can go over it. But before I even go down that, open that rabbit hole, I'd like to know what everybody's opinion is whether you would support this or not. So anybody can jump in. I'd like to jump in. Go ahead, Commissioner Bland. I think that it makes a whole lot of sense. The sad thing is we would have been out of this mess that we're in right now months ago if we'd had strong leadership and people that want to come forward and say, we need to all wear masks, we need to take our medicine now. We wouldn't be having to take our medicine. You know, I would encourage you know us to do everything that we can to take positive steps to uh, encourage people to think about other folks and to, I would be 100% behind it. Commissioner Miller, do you have a comment? I would just uh, share that I feel that our uh, <laughs> restaurants and uh, bars, I, I feel the employees should wear masks um, and I'm not seeing that. Uh, I've been out a couple times, I'm not seeing that. Uh, they interact with multiple tables, multiple people and personnel. It's, uh, you know, I would argue that it's difficult for a customer to wear a mask. Uh, you can't eat or drink with a mask on, but I think that the employees should as yeah, a I, policy. I believe there's an exception for eating and drinking. Obviously, you, you can't, you can't put food in your mouth if, or, or drink if you're about faces covered, but for things like if you're going to the Home Depot, you know, put a mask on. And there are some local businesses like Costco requires people that come into their store to wear a face mask. So does, uh, I was with my son this weekend, we went to the Guitar Center and they have greatly limited how many people can come in. And if you come in there, you have to wear a mask. And a guy came up and said, I don't have a mask. And they, and they weren't giving them out. They said, well, sorry, you can't come in until you get a mask. Uh, so there are some that are already doing that, but uh, would this board support a resolution saying that we would go along with the county were, if they were to, to mandate this? Mayor, 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 as you well know, you and I have talked a little bit about this, but uh, certainly this virus affects people of color uh, more than other races. And I, I have, and I'm a big fan of, of wearing face covering or masks. I, I, I preach that to my congregate. And also, most of the time you see me, I'm going to have a mask out where I'm going to the grocery store. And I, I can carry with uh, Dave. If, and what I truly believe is that the governor, and I'm not trying to predict, but I really believe he's going to put it to us this way. Either we all wear a mask uh, with the numbers going up, we're gonna go back to phase one. So there are gonna be a decision that the, the, the grocery stores and the restaurants have to make a, make a decision. Would you rather go backwards or stay where we are, wear a mask and try to bring the numbers down? I wholeheartedly support uh, your resolution. And I, I will hope that surrounding towns, I had opportunity a couple weeks ago to go down to Char uh, Bar 7 in Mint Hill. And I picked up an order, and as I, I and another lady was the only two had a mask. And I said, ma'am, thank you for wearing your mask. And she was so upset. She said, nobody in this crazy town gets it. We are not out of this, this uh, virus. Everybody there was, nobody wore a mask. So, yeah, I am, I am a mask a face covering person, wholeheartedly agree. And I think I can speak for the community of color that we support that as well too, Mayor. Commissioner McCool, did you have a comment? I wholeheartedly agree that 
we should go along with the county if they make this proclamation. But I agree with you that we should go out on the limb and do it without having the other communities with us. Commissioner Urban, do you have a opinion on this? I'll, I'm going to be devil's advocate. Um, uh, to, to Mr. Bland's point, I, I get it. But if everybody wore a mask, does not prevent people from getting it and is not going to do away with this virus. The vaccine, if it ever is produced, will be the only vehicle in which to get rid of this vaccine. Um, I, I'm really concerned about rights of the people. Um, I think if those who are highly um, vulnerable or feel they need to wear a mask or stay out of those establishments, that's fine. I do agree with Jeff Miller. Um, I have seen restaurants where some employees have worn masks and uh, gloves because they are in constant contact. But um, I'm ultimately concerned because I think it's, it's really, um, what's the word, a placebo in some regards because I've watched people put masks on and off, touch their face, touch the mask, take it off, put it back on, drop down below their nose. And so they're not properly administering and wearing to that aspect of it. And then they go about their business. They go shopping, they're wearing their mask, they get out to the car, they grab their mask, they get in the car. I just, you know, I, I'm just, I'm not, you know, if the board wants to go in that direction, that's fine. I support it. But I just, you know, in light of what we know about the mask, the fact that, you know, they do not stop the particulate unless it's an N95, um, I, I'm, I'm just not there. I'm, I'm really, I'm not there, period. I, I just like to make comment on that. I've received a few emails. I think the whole board has from folks saying that masks are ineffective. For me, I, I think it makes common sense that if someone, for instance, has COVID and they're coughing, I certainly would, if I was around them, I would appreciate the fact that they at least have something stopping some of the virus from coming out. I think it would have some, I would think it would have some positive effect uh, yeah, at I least. But I, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner, did you have a comment? I mean, I think at this point, we've seen the science proves that mask wearing is effective as a way to stop um, mass transmission. So I would wholly support the town going along with what the county decides. So thank you. Be before we look at this resolution, does, and does anybody, uh, and I don't, I don't want to sway the argument one way or the other, does anybody believe that Matthew should go it alone and, and say, we're going to require masks only in Matthews, regardless of what the county does. Does anybody have that opinion? Because there are some people advocating that. In the I think we should set an example for other people and lead by example and, and let people know that science says this, we're not gonna stick our heads in the sand and ignore it, you know? So you would be in favor of the town going alone? No, 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 I think that's foolish. I, I don't think we should do that. But what I said is we should lead by example by letting it be known that we think that's the correct thing to do. Well, I think this resolution addresses that. Lori, is it possible to put this resolution up because it's got a lot of parts to it? Mayor, 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 now, am I, am I correct? If Mecklenburg County makes this, uh, make this a, a mandate, and the town of Matthews says there are six other surrounding towns and say three others along with uh, the town of Matthews agree and go with that and the other two. Now I'm in favor of us going along with that. Whatever the whatever the Mecklenburg County say, that's what I'm in favor of us doing. I think that's what we all just said. Uh, uh, but yes. now, you know, I know that some other towns uh, might not, but uh, you know, I'm with, with Dave. I, I think that we ought to be a pace setter. We, it, we you know, we got to look out for Matthew's people and make sure that we stay safe. And our businesses that's open back up, get yeah, they get it if they want to stay now and keep making some making some money to get us back out of this economical. Then there's a there's a trade off. You know, you wear a mask. And keep doing what you're doing, or these numbers, are, as as Renee say, the numbers are, are speak for themselves. Uh, you've seen it, I've seen it. The last the last seven days of the week, these numbers have been going out of the ceiling, not just in Matthews, but all over the country for 
23, 23 states are showing an increase. But I'm in, I'm in favor of whatever Mecklenburg County say that we'll go along with that and whatever other towns do. But I, I, I think Matthews is what I'm hearing is we want to do whatever Mecklenburg County say it's going to do. So I, I think uh, we have the resolution up. I think probably some of you have the opportunity to, to read it. Um, Mr. Right Mayor. Now, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Can, can I interrupt? Yes, if we're sir. going to deal with the resolution tonight and if you're going to vote on it, then you need to add it to the agenda. The board okay. needs to add the resolution to the agenda before you vote on it. Okay, we, we'll do that. If we decide to vote on this, we'll move items, agenda item seven before six to do that um so what the current rules are for the county commission is it would for this to take effect would require for all of the other six towns and charlotte to go along with this um which is not real likely right now so what the what the uh, thought is is that if we did this maybe we would be leading by example and and maybe uh convince some of the other towns that are leaning the other way to go along with us i highly suspect that the governor is gonna make this a requirement anyway. I think it's coming really soon, this week, next week. I think the governor is gonna say, hey, the numbers are going up too high. Uh, we, need to, we need to do something. So I think that's, I think that's ultimately gonna resolve this. It's gonna be a statewide mandate, I believe. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Um, did everybody get a chance to read over the, um, the resolution? No. If you, Okay, well, let's just I'll, let's just go ahead and read it. Can uh, Jay or Jay, are you driving or Maureen? Uh, whereas the town of Matthews, like Mecklenburg County, the state of North Carolina, and much of the world is responding to the global pandemic known as COVID-19. Whereas the governor of North Carolina has declared a state of emergency on March 10th, 2020. Uh, whereas North Carolina General Statutes 166A, 19.22, and 19.31 authorize counties and municipalities to declare states of emergency and authorize the imposition of prohibitions and restrictions, whereas through joint proclamations, Mecklenburg County, the city of Charlotte, and the towns of Matthews, Cornelius, Davidson, Hunterville, Mint Hill, and Pineville have acted together to impose restrictions and guidelines to act in the best interest of the citizens of Mecklenburg County. Uh, and whereas the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention has issued guidance on the emerging and rapidly evolving situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, including how to protect oneself from illness, whereas the CDC has determined that COVID-19 is spread primarily between people in close proximity to one another and can be transmitted through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks, and recommends social distancing to prevent the continuous spread of the virus, whereas wearing a face covering in public settings, practicing social distancing and washing one's hands frequently are all measures which help slow the spread of the virus and help people who may be infected and unaware of it from transmitting it, the virus to others. Whereas the CDC recommends using face coverings or other non-surgical protective face masks to help prevent the continued spread of the virus. And whereas to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, a number of states and municipalities throughout the United States have mandated wearing face masks or other face coverings when in public and Whereas based on these facts, the town of Matthews Board of Commissioners urges Mecklenburg County to enact a countywide requirement for face coverings in certain circumstances to ensure all measures to protect the safety and health of all citizens and businesses to slow the spread of COVID-19 are being implemented. And, guess my place here, and be it further resolved, the following guidelines are recommended for applying the requirement that face coverings be worn in Mecklenburg County, number one, a face covering shall be worn while indoors. All customers, employees, and other use, users of restaurants, grocery, and retail stores, all occupants of public transportation vehicles, and all persons in any other indoor or outdoor situation in which people cannot maintain the physical distance required or recommended by the declarations. Uh, here's, here's a lot of the exceptions. Face coverings shall not be required by the following persons or situations. Those people whose religious beliefs prevent them from wearing a face covering, those people who cannot wear a face covering due to medical or behavioral condition, children who are under the age of 12, while dining in any restaurant, in private offices, uh, when complying with directions of law enforcement officers, in settings where it's not practical or feasible to wear a mask covering when obtaining or rendering goods or services, and with family or household members. So uh, again, this, this would not, uh, 
this would not really have any enforcement bite to it. It would just put peer pressure on people to, to wear masks when they're in indoor areas in town. So it sounds like the consensus of the board would like to endorse this, but we, as Charlie said, we'll have to uh, add it to the agenda. So can we maybe pick it back up under new business? Would that be acceptable, Charlie? Yes. Okay. Um, Mayor, I have one small question. Absolutely. Um, this, I, did I miss it? This doesn't address anything that I can see about general outdoors as right. long as you're six feet away. That's correct. This, this is just preventing people when you go inside of, when you're an indoor space, an enclosed space. You're walking on the greenway, you don't have to wear a mask. If you're outside, you don't have to wear one. Walking down a sidewalk. This is when you cannot, and I had an interesting conversation with another person that lives in Matthews this weekend about using the word social distancing versus physical distancing. I noticed we use the word physical distancing here. But So Mayor, point of yes. clarification, it, it is required outdoors if you cannot maintain social right. distancing. Yes. Yeah. So, for That's instance, clear. if you're in a line, if you're in a line to get in somewhere and, and you're right on top of each other, you'd have to wear a mask. That, that's correct. I, I stand corrected there. Well, um, what my concern is that it should not be required for the following persons or situations. Uh, I'm just thinking in my brain about the Greenway. If I'm walking the greenway alone and someone jogs going the other direction, it's a 10 foot wide greenway and you're supposed to be six feet apart. Um, are, are we gonna be, uh, how, are the, how would we treat that without it being dealt with or addressed? So Mayor- I would, say, I would say that didn't apply, but Hazen, do you, do you have a comment on that? So I. I, there is no enforcement arm. So there is not going to be, the police department is not going to be out there writing citations. So I, I do think the mayor said it earlier. I think really this is an effort to, from a social community, citizen to citizen standpoint, putting pressure on folks. But, you know, you're walking by, what are you, two seconds that you may be within, you know, six feet. I, I think common sense has to prevail here. And I assume most people got that uh, level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Urban. I, I, you know, <laughs> so we water down some areas and tighten up other areas, but let me go back to the first thing you said. Why, why wouldn't some of the board members mention this? Why wouldn't you want Matthews just to come out in front of this as opposed to Mecklenburg County? Why not just, you know, if you're trying to make a statement, if you're trying to put something out there, why would you not want Matthews to lead the other six communities? Yeah, the, the, the reasons I gave is are twofold. One that I think we don't want to go outside of our, our relationship with Mecklenburg County and kind of be thumbing our nose at them. I think, you know, we're trying to, we, uh, Deanna um, Diorio, Dina Diorio has worked very hard with us to try to work together. And I, I don't, I didn't want to break that relationship. Secondly, um, I think that, Let's face it, I, I wrote an email today and I think a lot of you saw it where I said, there's some people in Matthews and in every town that aren't gonna wear a face mask come hell or high water, they, they're not gonna wear them. And if we mandate that as individually as a town that everybody has to wear a face mask in Matthews, I think a lot of those people are gonna take their business to Mint Hill or Charlotte. It's gonna inadvertently hurt our businesses here. So those are the two reasons I have. Really, the main one is to maintain a relationship with the county and not thumb our nose at the county and say, we're going our own way, different than what you're, you're doing. But, okay. uh, Mayor, uh, if, if Mecklenburg County adopts masks for the county, would not we be ahead of the game by passing this resolution? And if the governor comes out Friday and makes it a mandate for all of North Carolina, would not this resolution put us ahead of the game already? Uh, I think it would make news that that we're at least having a discussion. I mean, look, I, I don't like wearing masks any, any more than anybody else. I can't stand them, but I, I do wear them when I can't socially distance out of respect for, for my fellow citizens. I, they're terrible. I had an N95 mask. I was with my son walking very fast and I, I could barely breathe. They're, they're, 
they're not real uh, comfortable things to wear, but I think you you do it out of uh, compassion for your fellow citizens. That's why I wear them. I'm not, you know, I'm thinking if I if it's possible that I have COVID, I certainly don't want to spread it to somebody inadvertently. So that's why I wear that's why I wear them. And I, I don't like them like <laughs> I don't like wearing masks just like anybody else doesn't like wearing them. But I think Commissioner Urban said it ultimately. I, what we really need is a vaccine, and that's. But again, I. I think we can pass this tonight, and I think the governor is going to come right in behind us and make this a state mandate anyway. I really believe that. Everything I'm hearing at the state level is we're about this close to the to the state because our numbers are not going down; they're going up. Well, no, that Mecklenburg County, but there are other reports. Of, I mean, in the in the agglomerate of the entire state, it's not the same as obviously in Mecklenburg County. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the governor is looking at because when he did the first order in phase two, he was looking at the statewide. You've got Wake, you've got Mecklenburg County that upset the numbers from that aspect of it. So I don't know. I don't know how they did dictate this at all. I have no clue. Yeah. Uh, Hazen, Hazen and I were speaking the other day and, and we both agree. I mean, just, just our thought that it's going to be very difficult to go back. It's going to be very difficult to say we're going to go back to phase one everybody stay at home yeah because i think a lot of people are, will say no i'm not going to do that and then what are you going to have i mean <laughs> so. i think well pandora's box is open so i mean you know hey you don't gave them stuff now it's hard to go back but you know let's face it the mass does two things if you are systematic it protects you from infecting somebody else and it protects the other person that if they are that you don't catch it so you know it's uncomfortable it is i tell you that but it's the time that we're in now and so we're doing the best we can for our citizens and for each other mayor, mayor pro tem garner do you have a comment did um uh, so I, from following what's going on in the state, I've seen, you know, Raleigh is requiring masks, Boone is requiring masks, towns and cities one by one are requiring masks. Um, the entire state is going up as far as numbers and percentage. So, um, I mean, I, I do see that the governor, it would make sense for him to require masks in North Carolina. But I, I think more than anything, what this resolution does is it brings awareness to the fact that people in Matthews aren't wearing masks right now. And I've received a number of emails from residents that are concerned about that, that want to go out but don't feel safe supporting businesses. So by putting this out there and reminding people that we are still in a COVID pandemic, um, we're putting ourselves in a good place to, to make people feel safe and feel comfortable. As, uh, Commissioner Miller. Just a note to everybody, you'll get a Town of Matthews mask uh, next time we get together, okay? Custom Thank you, Jeff. Off. Thank you, Jeff. Can you, can you autograph that for me, Jeff? Uh, it's black. <laughs> it's hard to get the ink on it with a Sharpie, but you all get one if, as soon as we can get together for a meeting. You, everybody gets one. So, so this resolution, again, we'll take it up on our new business, is really just a first step. It doesn't really obligate us to anything unless the county uh, puts in place uh, uh, their mandate, and it just says we would support it. And like I said, I think this is going to be a moot point shortly. I, I, I could be wrong, but I, I think the governor is going to require it. Uh, Commissioner Miller, you just brought up something that I wanted to touch on as well. Um, based on the numbers that I'm seeing in Mecklenburg County, I was the biggest proponent of us starting to meet again in person, but given the current situation, I think it's probably wise to hold our July meetings virtually as well. Does anybody have a different opinion? I think we should have them in person in July, have physical distancing and wear masks. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have an opinion on that? I think we should. I, I was talking with someone today and I said, you know, the most, one of the most essential services is government and that's what we, what we are. Um, you know, I think we can social distance and meet, but we're not at our, at our best when we're on Zoom and, and we got to really, you know, balance what, 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 like, you know, what our duty is and what the safety is. I mean, 
we can stream it on YouTube. We don't have to allow people to come. We can stream it. We can social distance. We did that the last meeting we had. Um, but it's it's the board to, to decide. Mr. Bland. <laughs> I'm opposed to it. You know, I think it makes a lot more sense. And, and although it was awkward at first, I'll be quite honest with you. I can look all of you straight in the eye, you know, where we're sitting at a bench, we're not looking at each other. This is a very effective way of, of doing it. Now, I like socializing with you guys, and it's sort of hard to do that when you're looking at each other on the thing. But as far as conducting the town's business, I think this is about as an effective a way of doing it as you can do it. And it's certainly safer. You know what I'm saying? It's We're not meeting a bunch of people. You know, how many people, are, what are like 15 people, even the, the minimum amount of people we would have is what? 15, 20 people in the room, you know, I just think it's not wise, but <clears throat> I'm opposed I, to it. I do know that other communities, I was, I believe I was speaking before, um, other communities have asked the legislature to extend, you know, we, we, we have uh, been given the right to have these meetings virtually, uh, Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's through the end of August. So if, so some communities are already asking for an extension so that they can meet virtually in all the way into September. Uh, I, I think it was Chapel Hill or Carver or one of those uh, one of those towns like that was was requesting that. Uh, I'm fine to go with the pleasure of the board. I suppose it's something we can vote on. Uh, we have to notice that as well, Charlie, so we can put that under new business. Yeah, I would add under uh, items to add. I'd add the resolution and whether to meet. Uh, virtually or to meet in uh, in person. In, and in I, I will respect the pleasure of the board. It sounds like it's gonna be a split decision. Um, so we'll, we'll see there. Does anybody have any questions for Hazen? He kind of jumped over that and getting into this resolution. Does anybody have any questions regarding the numbers or? Um... Well, I would just say, you know, unless you tell me I'm wrong, but the numbers are going up and up and up and up in all the in North Carolina and all the surrounding states. Is, is that not right? That is correct. And <laughs> why would we do this when things are getting worse? It, it I don't understand. It. But anyway, we'll vote on it, I guess. We'll vote. And I think for to just to add some data to that, when um, we were exiting phase one, the percentages of positives were at about 5.5 to 7% kind of on and off. And we're at 10% positives now, uh, reflective of even higher testing. So um, those numbers really are going up. And when we're considering meeting it as a board, we also have to consider that there are going to be other people in the room, town staff, and how comfortable are they being a part of that because they're not getting to vote on it. Okay, let's let's um, move on to agenda item number seven, items to be added to the agenda. I think we have two under new business, the resolution and whether or not we're going to meet virtually. Uh, Hazen, do we have anything else to add to the agenda? Uh, no, sir, Mr. Mayor. I do know that uh, one of the commissioners, Commissioner Whitley, asked that item uh, G on the consent agenda the approval of town attorney's annual contract be discussed and moved off the consent agenda. So we can add that under new business as well. Is that all right? Sure. Yeah. We don't need a motion or anything to do that. We can just move it. Is that correct? Uh, the way I understand the rules, if one person on the consent agenda uh, objects, then you do move it to new business. Okay. So that'll be another thing we'll discuss. So, um, know now that we don't we no longer have items 9a through h it'll be a through g oh. and the actual g will be moved to new business let's uh move on to the uh next item item number eight public comment i understand we have two comments for you are there additional ones uh no mayor we have one comment that i will read on behalf of the citizen and one comment that will be given in person excellent well, mayor we didn't vote on those items to add to the agenda do we need to do that? I guess we do. Yes, sir. All right, I will entertain a motion to add the three items to the agenda. The uh, resolution, 
um, a decision on whether we're going to meet virtually and uh, moving item G off the consent agenda to new business. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to do okay. that just as so long as one commissioner requested to be moved, okay. but that doesn't take a vote. Okay, the two items. Do I have a motion? So move. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner McCool, second from Commissioner Bland. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Bland? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. And I vote affirmative, so that passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we'll move on to public comments. Laura, you're going to first read a comment from Ken Horn, I believe. Uh, yes, this is from Kenneth Horn of Kings Manor Court in Matthews. <clears throat> In the aftermath of the recent killing of George Floyd and other events, our law enforcement agencies and police officers have come under attack. Our police officers are being personally vilified, accused of being racist, violent, and criminal. Some groups are going as far as demanding that we defund or abolish police departments altogether. It is undeniable that racism has a long history in our country, and it is also true that law enforcement has a history of abuse toward the African American community. However, it is also true that in our lifetimes, we have witnessed tremendous growth in our society as it relates to diversity and tolerance. This fact is clearly demonstrated by the wave of support for racial justice that is sweeping across the county, country. This does not mean that our society or our law enforcement departments are by any means perfect. These reoccurring events clearly expose structural problems in our law enforcement departments and society in general that need to be addressed. However, painting all of our police officers with the broad brush of racism is not only false, it is intellectually lazy. Furthermore, suggesting that police departments should be defunded or abolished is not only stupid, it is dangerous. We should not persecute all of our law enforcement officers for the acts of some. Instead, we should work with our police departments to address issues and work to improve safety and security for everyone in our communities. The police officers in our community do do much more than arrest people. They help you when your car breaks down and they come when there is a medical emergency. They come when your home is broken into at night and they provide protection to victims of abuse. When you call, they don't ask what political party you belong to or what church you go to, they just come. For their service, they should be respected. However, at the same time, our police officers and departments must be held to the highest standard of integrity. These events have exposed the enormous damage one bad cop or a handful of cops in a department can do, not only to individuals, but the community as a whole by undermining the trust that is needed to hold communities together. So my question is, what is the town of Matthews doing to address this issue? We have an appearance tree advisory committee, an environmental advisory committee, and an economic development advisory committee. But do we have a police oversight and advisory committee? And should we? Are trees more important than safety and trust? That is the end of his comments. Our okay. next um, if I could, Lori, I, I just want to remind uh, those that might be watching the public that we typically don't respond to, to uh, live in the moment to public comment, but we you know, will have someone, uh, town staff or someone reach back out in the near future to, to folks to, for a, a response if one is needed. I'm sorry, keep going to Ms. Harris now. Our next comment is from Eloise Harris. Ms. Harris, please wait until the timer is shown on the screen and then you can begin. You will have four minutes. Jay, could you show the timer, please? Uh, we may be actually having some technical difficulties. So Ms. Harris, if you could go ahead, if you're still talking when we get down to three minutes and 45 seconds, I will let you know that. That's fine. Thank you. First of all, good evening, Mayor Higdon, Mayor Pro Tem Garner, all commissioners, and uh, town manager Blodgett. I thank you for the privilege of speaking with you this evening. I'm Eloise Harris and I retired here from Chicago, Illinois in October of 2016 with my husband, Reverend John Harris, and we are pleased to be living in Matthews. And um, I am making a request of you this evening, uh, particularly after uh, sitting in on your meeting with the Chief of Police Pennington uh, this evening. 
I'm requesting that the town of Matthews and our police department adopt the These Eight Can't Wait initiative, which addresses uh, police use of force policies. I noticed that in speaking, in his speaking that the chief of police uh, used the term sanctity of life. Apparently the police department has a sanctity of life policy, which he preferred over the, or he preferred um, over the de-escalation training policy that is recommended in the initiative. I didn't understand why, I don't think he gave that uh, sufficient attention. And I'd like to know what the sanctity of life policy is and how it differs from the de-escalation training. So in order to adopt the initiative, one would also have to adopt, the, the town would have to adopt the de-escalation training as well. I believe there's a training center being built specifically for that purpose. Uh, ground has been broken for it. And I, I'm not sure if it's in the county, I think so. So I would like, to, uh, again, to recommend and request that the town adopt the These Eight Can't Wait initiative. I also have um, a concern about the, the updated complaint and compliment form that the chief showed on screen as part of his presentation. I noticed that race is, um, is requested on that form as well as gender. Uh, I think from the LBGTQ community, you might get some blowback on the word gender. I am concerned about the word race, why it's being used. Um, there is that issue of implicit bias and I'd like not to be, if I were ever to uh, submit either a compliment or a complaint, I would like not to be uh, judged based on my race and have that used somehow. So I'd like to request then, I am requesting that the term race be removed from the compliment and complaint form. That is my comment, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Uh, coincidentally, I had the opportunity to meet Ms. Harris and her husband uh, just this weekend uh, in the streets of Matthews. So I appreciate your comments. Someone will get back to you, Ms. Harris. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. All right, let's move on to item number nine, the consent agenda. I will entertain a motion to uh, adopt the consent agenda. I make a motion we approve consent agenda items 9A through F, omit G, and then H1 through 3. Excellent. Do we have a second? Second. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner Miller, a second from Commissioner Whitley. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley, how do you vote, sir? <laughs> yes. Commissioner Urban? Commissioner, Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Bland? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. And I vote yes, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Let's go on to unfinished business. Item 10A, consider Ottawa Road roundabout sign options. Mr. Blodgett. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. I'm standing in from, for Ms. Uh, Habina Willard. Um, so this is kind of a continuing saga a little bit about the Ottawa roundabout signs. And um, back in 2018, board uh, signed a red pastel resolution about aesthetic improvements to Ottawa. Uh, and we partnered with uh, Daiwa to design it. We're gonna split the cost with um, Mint Hill and it was for the roundabout circle. Um, so when we went to build it or whatever, uh, the price was $68,000. And I think the kicker was that, and DOT was going to, you know, they are gonna get rid of the roundabout in 2024. And I, I think everybody kind of did the math and thought, you know, kind of the cost benefit 
for this thing is not very good. So uh, Jay, if you can go to the next page. So the, the board directed staff to look for cheaper options. And um, that's what we did. Um, and it's uh, one of them is called Coritin Steel and Coritin Aluminum. And the, um, the bid for the, let me make sure I got this right. The only bid we got was uh, $94,000. So uh, the bidder mentioned that the court and steel would be cheaper. So we went out for bids for uh, cheaper or steel and also a different a, a type of a, aluminum and the prices came back at 86,000 and 75,000. Uh, you know, DOT is, as we know, is experiencing funding problems. So construction has been delayed and we don't know really when the roundabout's gonna be removed. So it's the useful life of the monument sign. I, you know, it should be much longer than original 2024. However, you know, given where we're at, you know, whether, whether it's budget stuff, the pandemic, and we are recommending at this point in time not to do anything eliminate the monument sign, go out for landscaping, about 20,000, do some landscaping, split it about $20,000, which would be split with Mint Hill. Oh, oh by the way, their, their town manager has a big problem with this too. So, and we, you know, we've kind of teamed up. So staff's recommendation is not to move forward with a structure at this time, but instead to put in landscaping material. Hey, Commissioner Miller, you have a question, sir. Thank you. Uh, Hazen, one of the benefits of the steel sign or aluminum sign um, was that it could be relocated, correct? That is correct. So it could be pulled up and put to the side of the road just on our side of uh, the Idlewild intersection. So my thought process is DOT is slow to move on the removal of this, it was sort of a, whatever that term is, boondoggle anyway, that they build it and it takes forever to build it, takes forever to light it up and then they make a decision to possibly remove it. I think they're gonna be equally slow in removing it and if it's portable and could be put on the side of the road uh, as you, enter Matthews near Idlewild, that's an argument that could be made, but uh, whatever. Okay, do we have other uh, comments? Commissioner Urban. Um, Hazen, where does this fit? Was this something we had in CIP? We've already budgeted, it's sitting there. If we don't pull the trigger, where's, where, where does the money go back to or we hadn't allocated? So uh, CJ and Susan are on the call, which is I am thankful for. Could be tourism. It would be tourism. I don't know, CJ. Do you know if we ended up? Does does do you know if there's money set aside for this beautification project? I'm sorry, I don't recall. Hopefully, Susan does. Yeah, this is Susan. I don't think we ever got to a point where we were decided where the funds would come from. I just don't think we've gotten there yet. So my, my assumption it would be out of whatever budget the other welcome signs, the other monument signs for the tourism. Yeah, it is it guaranteed. Well, obviously, it would be tourism. I think the question is, did we set aside any budgeted money in the tur tur tourism capital improvement program? And I don't think we did. So we would have to find the money. And, you know, uh, uh, if nothing else, I think I, if, if, if the will of the board was like, let's go forward, my recommendation would be wait to, well, there'd be two things. One, wait until we get the uh, latest audit back from um, the auditor, which would probably be in October. And then we do need to make sure we can talk in Mint Hill into on board of this too, because Susan, as I understand it, the manager over in Mint Hill thought this was too darn expensive. Let me follow up. What was the cost of our standard freestanding brick pier? If we weren't doing it in the circle, if we were going down south of the circle, 
and we wanted to put up one of our normal brick pier ones. Do anybody know what the cost of that was? I mean, because basically what I'm thinking at this stage in the game is we've, we've tortured this thing um, due to landscaping, wait to see where the economy goes and then move our sign or put in a sign um, south of the, of the uh, traffic circle um, where the old sign was. And I'm just sort of offering that up. So just, but I, I'm wondering what is that, what is our freestanding sign cost? Because it's probably relatively close to this whole contraption. Well, the freestanding sign, the original sign wasn't movable. Oh, I know, I understand that. I'm not talking about putting it in the traffic circle. I'm saying due to landscaping and then down the road, we put in one of our regular ones south of the traffic circle where our old sign was. That's a very plausible solution. I just ignore dealing with Mint Hill and we move on. And uh, this has been, <laughs> we're still gonna be talking about this when the road, when the traffic circle does go away. Uh, just uh, for the record, I, I never supported the sign from the get-go because I thought at best it would not be ideal if we if we moved it. It's not going to be really what we want for a moved sign. So, and I, I also think the cost is outrageous. I like what Commissioner Urban has suggested. Let's do the landscaping, and at some point down the road, put totally agree. Let's you know maybe put one of the, the other type signs down the road and not, not even worry about this circle. And, um, does anybody else have any thoughts on this, Mr. Hey, Hayes? Hey, Hayes, did, did you say that Mint Hill was willing to share in the landscaping price as well? Uh, I yes, that's my understanding, Susan. If that, if I'm wrong, please correct me. And, and, and you you did say about twenty thousand. Yes, sir. Our share would be about ten. Okay. Total 20. Yes, sir. Okay. Do I have a motion? I'll go ahead and make a motion if we want, and then you get a discussion. I'll make a motion that we uh, uh, withdraw the conversation about the sign, go with landscaping only, and address the sign at a later date for another location. Thank you. All right, I'll, we have second, a I'll, second it. I'll second it, John. We already have a second by Commissioner Bland. You're okay. Too, too slow on the trigger. Uh -huh. So we have a motion by Commissioner Urban, second by Commissioner Bland. We'll do a roll call vote. The motion is to do the landscaping, split the cost with Mint Hill, and consider a sign perhaps at a different location, maybe where the current sign is at a later date. Correct? John, did I state that correctly? Thank you. All right. Commissioner Whitley, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Bland? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. I vote yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Let's move on to item 10B. Consider easement agreement for Eden Hall Recreation Trail. Mr. Blodgett. Uh, I didn't see. Is Corey on the on the line? He is not, Mr. Blodgett, you're handling this item. Okay, so um, back when Eaton Hall was was constructed, well, back when they we approved the zoning condition or zoning petition for Eaton Hall, there was an agreement that they would build eight foot wide gravel multi-use path behind their uh, property, which they have done uh, and they are in part of the Zoning conditions is that at the appropriate time they would turn it over to the town, and now they are asking the town to accept uh, uh, maintenance and the easement agreement related to this uh, piece of property. Mr. Manager, right now, this is the agreement where they will dedicate it to the town. We'll come back with a resolution at the second meeting in July to pick up not only this portion, but the portion that cross. Uh, uh, the acts or the plantation uh, estates property so that we'll do one resolution adding that accepting it for maintenance but tonight is to um, approve their dedication to the town okay thank you charlie Are there any questions is it mayor is the um, trail been constructed to the specifications 
and to the quality of acceptance that the town is willing to take or, or are there any deficiencies that need to be addressed before we take it over? CJD, I mean, I, I, what I can say is I have uh, whatever ridden or walked on that path recently within the last 60 days. And I know they put a lot more uh, rock uh, on the back portion over there by plantation estates. CJ, do you have anything to add? This is yeah, it's my understood. Uh, oh, yeah, ahead, I have done several inspections of the trail with um, the parks department. And they we have had numerous requests for um, fixing the trail, which they have. And, so we feel confident with the, the level that the trail is in. Um, sorry, CJ, go ahead. CJ, what is the average stone size? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Susan, if I understand you correctly, that it does it does meet our acceptance criteria, correct? That's correct. I, I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Go ahead. Um, let me pull it back up. To um, authorize for the manager to enter into the easement agreement dedicating recreation trail property to the town of Matthews that runs behind Eden Hall, called the Eden Hall Recreation Trail. I have a second. Second. I think we have a motion made by Mayor Pro Tem Garner, a second by Commissioner McCool. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Bland. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner McCool. Yes. I vote affirmative as well. So that passes unanimously. Thank you. Before we move on, can I ask a question about that? That's not sure. really. Um, the, the agreement says that it's to be a, to create bicycle and pedestrian connectivity. And I haven't walked on that portion of the trail, but I've walked between plantation estates and bubbling well a handful of times. How are people supposed to bicycle across that gravel? Very carefully. I don't know. Hazen, have you, you biked it? I did bike it, but it was very, very fresh stone. In fact, I got in the way of the equipment. I, ha I it, maybe Susan has biked it uh, when it's, when it's compact, it should be okay. I mean, it's not, it's not great. But. I mean, I find it hard to walk on with, I mean, my mom and I walk on it and find it hard to walk on. So I feel like bicycling would be really tough. Um, Mayor um, and Hazen, if you recall, we had talks uh, early on that once they were done with the gravel portion that we might come in and pave it ourselves sometime in the future. Yeah, that would be preferable if we can find the money for sure. Thank you. Sorry for letting me take mm -hmm. us on a tangent. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, we're gonna move on to new business. First, we're gonna receive the monthly budget report from Beth Blair. Hazen's getting down to business, taking his jacket off. Beth, you're on mute. Good evening, everybody. Um, you have before you the May financial report. I'll keep it short and sweet. As far as the general fund, our revenues are about 39,000 ahead of expenditures year to date and our tourism funds about 17,000 revenues greater than expenditures year to date. We are expecting for the year our revenues to be greater than expenditures. We're tracking well with our sales tax projection. We just looked at that within actually today. And um, so our projections are a little bit ahead. I mean, our actuals are a little bit ahead of our 
projections for sales tax. We have some uh, big amounts to come in, for example, for utility taxes that we only receive quarterly in June, but everything indicates, as I say, that will be ahead revenues versus expenditures for the year. I hesitate to quantify yet um, because of what I just said, still some large chunks to come in of revenue in June and then expenditures. There's certainly some variability in that at year end not knowing how much of some big projects will be completed by year end. So, but overall, I think we should be in good shape ending the year. Okay, are there any questions for Beth? No. Okay, hearing none, thank you, Beth. Sure. That was short, short and sweet. Uh, we will move on to the previously discussed uh, resolution in support of requiring face coverings to be worn in Mecklenburg County during COVID-19 pandemic. I read it previously. Uh, do I have a motion? Mayor, yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the resolution as read previously. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Whitley, a second from Commissioner Bland. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Urban. Yes. Commissioner Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Bland. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner McCool. Yes. And I vote yes as well. Thank you. Let's move on to uh, new business item C, a discussion about whether or not uh, we wish to have uh, virtual meetings in the month of July. Is there any discussion on this? Can I piggyback on what um, Commissioner Miller indicated? It is, and this is a question for Hazen and, and Lori and Becky and staff, twofold. One is, do we have the technology available for commissioners to be in attendance physically in the space and for commissioners to physically attend via Zoom from our main room? The second question is, is staff comfortable that they could provide for the appropriate social distancing, we did it one time, um, for those commissioners who may want to attend physically versus work remotely. I, I'm of the mindset is to let those who wish to um, uh, do it via Zoom, continue to do it via Zoom, and those who wish to be in, on the dais to be on the dais. Uh, so I'll speak first, but Lori, I think, you, you know, Lori, we've actually, We've set up the room to see what it looked like, social distancing and those kind of things. Um, it's, I think, you know, the board can't sit up there together and social distancing. Now, if we if we right. swept all around the room, and then, you know, then you're it, there's just not much room in the in the room <laughs> to respect social distancing. I, my recommendation would be. This has worked. I know it's a little wonky, but it has worked. Um, my perspective would be to continue this. Uh, Lori, I, do you know what the legal, are we in like mushy legal ground to have a meet, you know, a, a regular meeting? And then how do we meet the requirement, legal requirements for folks that can't attend or don't want to attend? So the legislation does allow us to do that, does allow the board to meet in person and remotely together. The That's problem cool. really is more of the technical aspect of it. Staff does need to continue working on this, but so far we recognize that you would definitely be able to have some people meet in person and some people meet using the phone option, but we are struggling to get people to be able to use the video option remotely. That technology has so far not, we've not been able to figure out how to do that and have a useful meeting that can be seen and heard by everyone. And I think losing that face-to-face -face connection is a significant hindrance to having a productive meeting. 
But Lori, if I understand you correctly, you're saying it's difficult to video those that are there in person and add the Zoom participants into one video that you're, you're broadcasting, is that what you're saying? That's correct. There are some technical difficulties when you have multiple Zoom meetings happening in one room, you'll get a lot of feedback and you can't truly hold a meeting with that technical feedback going on. We've can not- we hire a, Can we hire a 12 year old to tell us how to fix it? <laughs> I mean, there are, there are options that we could pay money to get this corrected, but I do not know how much that would be. And I suspect it would be significantly more expensive than you would like. Commissioner Miller. Um, that reminds me, Lori, um, I had a Zoom meeting partially in person and partially with people from afar. And because there's a delay in all of our uh, laptops and microphone and, and cameras, the, there's not much of a, there's no delay if you're in the room and I'm talking to John Higdon personally, but in a second and a half, it's gonna come out of your laptop. And uh, it is uh, difficult to mix and match Zoom in the same room. Yes, there, there is another, that, that's the primary technological issue that we have. The secondary is actually setting up everyone so that you all can be seen by the members of the public who can't physically attend. That's a limitation of the cameras and the function of the room that we have. So that's another kind of a secondary consideration, but that is another problem that we've still not corrected. We've, we've heard from the town manager, Lori, do you and Becky have an opinion as to whether you would prefer to be in person or? I, I would certainly recommend that you continue to meet remotely. Yes. My recommendation is also that we continue remotely. And may I point out one thing, At the July meeting, there's about six public hearings and it would be very difficult have everybody who wants to make a presentation to the public hearing in the the meeting room, where will they be and how do they make their presentations? And those who are not making their presentations, where will they stand? It just works better, I think, having it on the Zoom just for July. Okay, are there any other comments, motions? Mr. Mayor, in deference to those who may feel uncomfortable attending, I don't have a problem continuing with the remote meetings. What I have a problem with, going to Charlie's point, is potentially having four or five or six public hearings via Zoom because the process does slow down. You could take our standard three or four hour night and double it very easily using this technology. Is there a means or a method in which to triage some of these public hearings and, and start talking to those petitioners about maybe spreading them out a little bit further um, because it, it just, the myriad of information that we have to absorb and then communicate with one another and visually see on these screens and work it, I, I, it's just gonna prolong the inevitable. And frankly, I think we inevitably will miss things in this mode of operation. So I don't have a problem continuing to work remotely, but I do have a problem with overwhelming the system with all those public hearings. Yes, Charlie. I, I just want to say that some of the reasons why the uh, applicants wanted it continued, <laughs> those reasons may still be in effect. Those are things beyond our control. And so Jay may be able to, as you say, triage and come up with how many want to go ahead with a public hearing and how many want it continued even again. I, I would uh, caution you, just think about the fact that if you do postpone some, to the, re the next regular meeting, you're just going to avalanche all of the cases that you have. You, If you do wanna look at that, you might wanna consider holding a meeting on a different Monday or a diff an off day that's, so that we can eventually catch up. Maybe we add, an, add a meeting just to do public hearings. Yes. Okay. Okay. Jay, can you get a report on who's plan on going forward and who's gonna ask for deferrals uh, in July? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, would anybody like to make a motion? Motion. I would, Mayor. Okay. 
I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we uh we continue uh virtual for the month of July uh in lieu of uh all that we've heard tonight. I think it's the right thing to do right now. So that's my motion. I have a second. I'll second. Commissioner Bland. So we have a motion by Commissioner Whitley, a second by Commissioner Bland. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Bland? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Sure. <laughs> Commissioner McCool? Yes. <laughs> I vote yes. We're, we're such a controversial board. We. Uh, that passes unanimously as well. So, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do in abundance of caution. Hopefully we can start meeting again in August. We'll see. Uh, I know that there's several of you and I'm consider myself one of them that would like to meet in person if we can make it happen. So we'll certainly uh, hope, hope for some improvements in July. Um, I think that's, that finalizes our new business. I'd like to go on with the mayor's report agenda item number 12. Well, I just like to say you've got that the attorney's yeah. contract. Yeah. Attorney's contract. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. <coughs> we'll not go to mayor's report. We'll go to the attorney's contract. Commissioner Whitley, you had a question. Yeah. About yes. Attorney's contract. I, I did. Uh, I'm, I've been with the town now for five years. Uh, three years as commissioner and two as planning board. And I've come to know uh, attorney Charlie Buckley um, in those five years to be a very good friend. And when I saw it on the consent agenda, I just didn't think that did the appropriate uh, to have him uh, on the consent agenda. With that being said, Charlie, would you tell this boy how many years you've been with the town? 42 and a half. 42 and a half. And then those 42 and a half years, how many mayors have you served on the child? Oh, gosh. Uh, All of them. Uh, no, Clay Leffler was the first, and then... Um, Sean Lamont, and then, then so I guess uh, six. And and my my point for moving Charlie from the consent, I, I just think as a, as many years as he is committed to this town and the work that he's done, and as a personal friend, Charlie and I are the two oldest on this board, and he and I talk uh, privately about that a lot. And I hope we can bring some wisdom to this board. And I certainly know that Charlie has. With that, in, with that being said, I just wanted to pull him out so that we can give him the due proper from this board of thanking him for many years of service and then personally make a nomination that we continue with his annual uh, as our turn, town attorney. And that's a motion, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Second from Commissioner Bland. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Bland. Yes. Commissioner McCool. Yes. Commissioner Miller. How'd you guys swap spaces? Yes. I vote yes as well. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Charlie, for your thank many you, years of service. We appreciate thank it. all of you for that. That was unnecessary, but thank you very much, Commissioners and Mayor. All right, I've got a couple items for the mayor's report. The first is that there was a uh, Black Lives Matter rally um, in town this weekend on Sunday. Um, I, I'd just like to say that uh, I think it was one of the, the most organized uh, rallies that I've ever ever participated in or ever seen. Uh, a young mother in town, Melissa Hayslip Smith, organized it with several of her friends in a, in a very short time. They had every detail uh, where they were going to meet, where they were going to march to, the PA system. Everybody had water. Everybody had masks. Very orderly. Um, and I, I was particularly impressed by, I believe it was Miss uh, Smith's husband who was there, uh, instructed everybody, said, when we leave town hall today, let's make sure they didn't, never knew we were here. So they took every speck of garbage, water bottles, signs, and, and removed them. So it was just a very, very well done rally uh, with just the right amount of uh, our police were there. They did a great job. So just a, a really pleasant, peaceful rally. Um, I had the opportunity to speak there. Mayor Pro Tem Garner did as well, but uh, very well done. I wanted to mention that uh, Larry Whitley was there and he spoke as well. Secondly, um, 
I know many of you are aware that there is a group of folks led by uh, MP, uh, gentleman that owns the UPS store, uh, some other uh, former town leaders, Jim Taylor, Paul Bailey, uh, Barbara DeMint, Steve Huff, uh, Toby Thrasher, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a, a few folks, uh, Dr. Patel, uh, that got together in, in an effort to try to raise $100,000 for the Help Center. And they are about, uh, last check with Jim, I believe we're somewhere over $60,000. And they asked me, uh, Jim Taylor asked me to come before our elected board and ask if you personally, if you guys would like to make a donation to the Help Center. We used to do this previously when Jim was mayor um, around Christmas time, we would always take up a collection for the Help Center. And uh, so if you'd like to do that, I would ask you to, uh, perhaps give a check to Lori before maybe our next meeting and we will um, give it to the help center. We have so many uh, people in need in town that the needs have outstripped the resources. Um, so if you'd like to participate in that before the next meeting, give it to uh, Lori and I'll make sure that the help center gets it on behalf of the elected body. Um, I, we did get some other good news the other day. Hazen, you may be able to update us on it, but the monies from the CARE Act, are you aware? I, I heard that it was awarded at a substantial amount to the health center. Are you aware of that, Hazel? I didn't, I am not. I knew that the request went in for $210,000. Does, is that, you know? I, I had heard uh, anecdotally, I haven't seen written confirmation that they had received that or some substantial portion. So uh, just to reiterate the, I think everybody knows this, but for maybe the, I'm sorry, uh, Becky, do you have a comment? Sorry, I, I can speak to that. I was on a call with Sarah Cunningham, their finance director last Friday, and she confirmed that um, the board of commissioners did take action to approve all of the town requests for funding that the county was going to set that aside and then determine what to do with the remaining funds. And so included with um, the town of Matthews request was the $184,000 in town expenses $210,000 for the Matthews Help Center for mortgage and rental assistance, and then $300,000 that EDAC will be directing to um, support. Um, we're still trying to get clarification from the county, but it will support um, small businesses um, and hopefully also nonprofits. But we're working with the county on the exact structure of what that support would look like um, to make sure that we keep ourselves legal on that. So for, for all of us, I, I'm looking particularly at Commissioner Urban that have served on EDAC. Can you imagine, John, that they're now going to have $300,000 to help uh, prop up small businesses somewhere? But, effort because we've had uh, several special meetings in the last month, and um, we took a swag at a number, and lo and behold, it looks like we're going in the right direction. Imagine that. That. Is, that is incredible. So... Again, to follow up with the help center, they're, they're, they are using the money for temporary assistance. I think all the elected officials know that. I'm saying this mostly for the public. It's for temporary assistance for those that need help with rent, um, you know, to pay their mortgage, to pay their utility bills, water bill, light bill. And um, it helps a lot of people in our town. It's amazing. There's thousands of families that are helped. So if you'd like to participate in that, please do. It's much appreciated. You make the, the final, check out to me. Make the check out to Matthews Help Center. Yes, make it. That's okay. correct. Matthews Help Center, and get, if you can give it to Lori, we'll uh, make sure that it gets delivered to the Help Center, and, and they'll um, receive notice that the elected board made a donation. Appreciate that. Um, the only final thing I want to say is I, I really appreciate uh, Lucia for staying awake for this entire meeting. That's pretty phenomenal. I think it looks like she might maybe ready for bed at this point, but. Uh, Great job. I appreciate your interest in uh, what we do as a town. And uh, uh, you did what many adults don't do. You made it through an entire meeting. So that's fantastic. Uh, that's all I have. We'll move on to the attorney's report. No report, but just want to say thank you to all the board for the adoption of the contract. It's just as much a privilege today. It was the first time I had a contract in March of 78. And I feel just as privileged today as I did then. And thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Town manager report. I only have one thing. Um, we, last week, I sent out an email to the board about as a way to thank our officers, police officers, uh, serving them a meal. 
kind of like the department heads do for the employees at Christmas. And I am behind on emails. Maybe everybody responded. So I guess I would ask if you're interested, please let us know. And then we will kind of get you into the hopper. I understand there may be, up, you know, quarantining issues, right? You'd rather stay away, but I just want to try to get a count who's interested in helping and then we'll figure out the logistics of putting some meals together and serve the officers. You don't have a date yet? No, sir, we do not have a date. Okay. Let me just say that if there's any way possible you can participate in that, let's please do it. I, I think you heard kind of the almost desperation in a chief's uh, voice tonight uh, in, in maybe us not doing as good a job as we could to thank our police officers for all they do. And I think this would be an excellent opportunity uh, to serve them and tell them that in person. So if, it's, if there's any way possible you can participate, that would be great. We, we would appreciate it. So any other business before us tonight? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Jeff Miller to adjourn. Second by Commissioner Ken McCool. We'll do a roll call, call vote. Commissioner Willie, do you want to adjourn or not? Well, could y'all start back? Yeah, I <laughs> Commissioner Urban. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Bland. Commissioner McCool. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Yes for me. Good night. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Appreciate Stay it. Stay safe.